Good evening. Our, uh, this lecture will be Leilu Nishmat Lev Ben Ephraim Yosef and Lerfuat Hana Bat Marcel Gedalia Asher Ben Shoshana Miriam Leilu Nishmat Svatlana Bat Svatlana Golda Bat Serach. And uh, one announcement, as you know, Sunday I'm flying to Eretz Israel for the entire month of Elul. I'll be back right before Rosh Hashanah, so we will meet again between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. The Tuesday of Aseret Yemet Shuvah, please remember that. Anyone who needs a tefillin, mezuzot, and megilot ester, I brought very high level ones. Of course, the prices are less than half of anywhere else, you still can do it until Friday when I'm still here, because I know some people send email, I'm just losing track. Uh, what other announcement I had to do, to do, I just want to make sure I didn't forget anything. Are you having a shiur in Bet Shemesh? I'm going to have shiur in Bet Shemesh in English, yeah. Uh, you want to know the date? The date will be, I'll tell you in a minute. That's a good uh, thing you reminded me, like these people ask, they can, they can watch it now. The shiur in Bet Shemesh will be on uh, Wednesday, August 30th. Flyer will be published. Anyone who wants to join my uh, WhatsApp group, because a lot of the people say, oh, we didn't know you're coming, we didn't know you're here, we didn't know you're there. On the WhatsApp group, everything is there. You get all the information. Please email me with your telephone number, ravamizrahi at gmail.com. We add you to the WhatsApp group. You can get two videos in English, two to three videos per day, and share it with others. Of course, these lectures also must be shared. The rule is the same rule. You don't want to share, don't watch. I have less views. I'm not worried about it. But I want those who watch to be Jews that care about others. You want to save your soul? Beautiful. There's no reason why you won't want to save your friends, neighbors, relatives, anyone you can save. If they don't have patience to sit and watch long lecture, no problem, I understand. Send them short clips, six minutes, five minutes, three minutes. If they are totally beginners, there are thousands of videos. Choose the one that speaks about proofs. Nothing provocative, no musar. No punishment, no gain, no, nothing of that. Proofs, proofs they can handle. Everyone can handle proofs, right? After you see they starting to make a progress, give them the app, let them download the app and choose by topic. But that's an obligation, by the way, of every Jew, regardless of what I say. Even before I announced it, that's an obligation from the Torah that everything that you have in your, in your hand that can help other Jews to get closer to Hashem and you don't do anything about it, you will be held guilty for that. One million percent, without a doubt. The same way Hashem reward a person that inspire others even when he didn't do that much, just by the way he prayed. People see him in the synagogue, how serious he is. Just by the way he learns in yeshiva, how serious he is. Just by how much he's watching his eyes and his mouth, not to speak Lashon Hara, it inspires people, even if he didn't try. The same way, if you are going in a crooked, rotten way, you influence people in a negative way. If you are in yeshiva and you wake up late, after the time of Kriyat Shema and you skip Shachrit, you, by the time you show up it's ended already. On Shabbat you go to pray at 10 o'clock, the biggest Chilul Hashem. Better not to open the shul. I don't understand how they have no shame to start to pray at 10, 10, 30 on Shabbat. What is this? Soon it's almost Mincha. People have no shame. If you see something happen, okay, once in a blue moon. But to do it routinely, it's Chilul Hashem. I won't forget my Rav in Yeshiva of Berkovitz, yes, 25 years ago, or more maybe. He came one time, he gave, we used to give shiurim in uh, Nefesh Achaim, of Chaim Ivolojim. It's very deep. I never forget it. Listen, it's 25 years, I still have his image in front of my eyes. He said today, 
for the first time after so many years I had to daven alone. I did not pray minyan. It was like shaken up the whole day. Why? Because my only option to daven was at 9 a.m. And I came to the conclusion it's better to daven home than to show up in a shul at 9 a.m. It's such a chilul Hashem. Chilul Hashem, the oraita, it's such a horrible sin. Chilul Hashem, there's no mechila for it until the day of death. Davening in Minyan, as important as it is, it's still a rabbinical obligation. To do a Chilul Hashem in order for me to gain rabbinical obligation doesn't seem to me what Hashem wants. What about Hasidim? Ask the Hasidim. Ask them. Why are you asking me? I'm not a Hasid. Lo zachiti liot Hasid. Ask the Hasidim. First of all, by the way, to say Hasidim, it's big general, generalizing. I <laughs> know Hasidim at 5 a.m. already in a shul in, in Tfilat Netz, after Mikveh. Thousands of them I met over the years. They are Hasidim, and they are Hasidim. They are Litaim, and they are Litaim. They are Sfaradim, and they are Sfaradim. They are Baalei Tshuva, and they are Baalei Tshuva. Everything has different levels in life. You understand? So, you know, listen. Some, some people, because they learn until very late at night, so therefore, they start the day very late, but that's not smart. Better they start the day early and they finish the day a little earlier. They don't have to stand till late. It's the same amount of hours, at least there's no Chilul Hashem. The people that see you at 10 o'clock and still coming out of the synagogue, they do not know you learn until 3 a.m. By the time you went to sleep, it was 4 in the morning. They see you now coming to the synagogue at 9, after 4 hours of sleep, 5 hours of sleep. You're thinking, what a tzaddik I am, I barely sleep. But the people that see you, 300 people that saw you today in the shul and thinking, this is a Ben Torah, he's not embarrassed to show up at 9 a.m. They don't know you learn until 3 a.m. Better you go to sleep at 11, 11.30, 12, wake up early, come to the shul at lay early, 6.30, 7, 7.30, 8, the latest. 8, it's already, that's it. It's borderline. After that, it's mamash busha. And there is no excuse, I sleep late. Change your schedule. Who told you to sleep late? Some people think that because I do something great, it allows me to get discounts on other things. That's a big mistake, and that's the advice of the Satan. The advice of the Satan. The Satan many times knows he cannot cool your excitement from learning and steigen and, late and learn until late. It's a big mitzvah to learn. So when it comes to Daven in a normal time, the Satan says, ah, come on, you compare this to what you do. You stay extra three hours at night after everyone goes to sleep and you learn. It's a big deal. So you come to Shul late. No, no, no. No, no, no. The Satan is very happy with that. The Chilul Hashem that you do, it's devastating in Shammai. And I'll give you a proof for it. Nobody can answer this proof. What was the reason Moshe Rabbeinu did not enter Israel? That he hit the rock instead of speaking to the rock. Moshe Rabbeinu dedicated more than 80 years of his life to the Jewish nation. 40 years in the desert, and then when he was a teenager in the palace of Paro, he gave up all his comfortable life. He had to kill the Egyptian, he had to run to Midian, he had to be there for so many years. More than two-thirds of his life, he sacrificed for the Jewish nation. The Torah testified that he's the most righteous man ever, the greatest prophet ever, the most humble person in history. And no one is more L'Shem Shamayim than Moshe Rabbeinu. There's no argument about that, right? Every human being in the world that knows about religion knows it. It's not a questionable matter. After all his great merit, he caused one minute of Chilul Hashem. But the Chilul Hashem he caused was not intentional. He was in the middle of sacrificing himself for the sake of heaven, for Hashem, 
thinking he's going to do Kiddush Hashem and an accident happened. There was one minute of Chilul Hashem that he hit the rock and nothing happened and the lefty liberals, Bernie Sanders, Chuck Schumer and their friends started to laugh and had so much fun that the chief rabbi is being embarrassed in public now for one minute, that's it. One minute of Chilul Hashem, not intentional. With the intention to do Kiddush Hashem. There's no question about it. No one is denying it. And that was the reason that Hashem said, you disappointed me, you embarrassed me, you did not sanctify me. For that, you and Aaron cannot enter the Holy Land. Moshe, no. But Aaron, what did he do? The answer is, he could have prevented the Chilul Hashem and did not. After the first shot, when he was about to eat again, he was supposed to grab his hand and say, no, what are you doing? Hashem said to speak to the rock. If he would do it, the one minute Chilul Hashem with all the clowns, all these traders laugh, would have been prevented. Because it wasn't prevented, Aaron also didn't enter Israel. Think about it. Now you begin to understand what does it mean Chilul Hashem. You remember, all the sins of the Torah include murders, include Chilul Shabbat, include rape, include pedophilia, include anything you can imagine. Even Avodah Zarah can be erased if you repent correctly. You can repent, you're going to get suffering, you're going to go through the process, but eventually you can erase the Chilulei Shabbat. You can erase the Avodah Zarah. You can erase the murder. What happens if you murder 20 million people? Can you erase it? Even that you can erase. What's the proof? Nevuzardan. He killed 20 million people and then did tshuva and converted to Judaism and the Chachamim accepted him. Rachav, the worst woman on earth, did tshuva and became the wife of the most important tzaddik in the world, Yoshua Benun. Itro, the master of idol worshipping. There's not one idol worshipping he wasn't an expert in. Machti Arabi Machi Gadol in the world, became a tzaddik, converted, became the son-in-law of Moshe Rabbeinu, the chapter about, uh, name after him in the Torah, and everybody remember him as a big tzaddik. The greatest convert perhaps in the history. Same thing Ruth, and many other examples like this. So you see that every level of wickedness that you can reach, you can also repent for it, except one thing, Chilul Hashem. No way to fix it. How does he die? Until the day of death. Meaning, of course, you are fixing it, you're regretting it, you're, you're praying, you're Yom Kippur, you cry for it. Every day when you die, when you ask Hashem to forgive you for that horrible Chilul Hashem you committed. But no matter what you do, it's still in your file pending until the last day of your life. You cannot erase it from your file. You can't. Until the day of death. And the day of death, it will only be erased if you did a serious, massive tshuva for it. Meaning, if you didn't do tshuva, it will stay forever. You know? <laughs> so that's why a lot of people don't understand. They, do, they want to do something good, and at the same time, they cause Chilul Hashem. Just one thing, not to be confused. Sometimes people ask me, what happens when I have to argue with the wicked people who make fun at Hashem, make fun at religion, make fun at the rabbis, make fun at me? that I'm too fanatic, maybe I belong to a cult, maybe my rabbi is some kind of a guru. <laughs> you know, these people. Clowns will always find what to say. Remember the lecture from a month ago? The clown will always find what to say. If I answer these people, I can crush them in an argument. Everybody knows that they only find excuses because they do not want to be righteous. 
They want the righteous also lower, to be lower to their level, that they feel comfortable with their level. There's two ways to become righteous, the real way and the fake way. The real way is elevate yourself to the level of the righteous people. The fake way is, I don't want to work hard to make myself righteous. Let me bring the righteous people down to my level. Offer them some alcohol, free trip to Miami. I have a boat there, come, I'll take you on the boat. One thing leads to another, a month later he's gonna have a Goya girlfriend. This tzaddik, why? The trip to Miami. That's how it works. I cannot be in your level, let me bring you to my level. Sometimes it can be as easy as offering him a very tempting job, who makes good money. Bachur Yeshiva is broke, doesn't have money. He just went on a date with a girl that he liked very much, and she told him, you're not rich enough for me. I appreciate your Torah, I appreciate that you're righteous, I even appreciate that Hashem loves you very much, He loves the Amelie Torah, but I do not love you, because you don't have five million dollars to offer me. So now he has a mental crisis. How does it help me that I give my life for the Torah? The girl didn't even want me. She would replace the Torah with money and comfortable life. So the question is, you know, person feel uh, maybe it's time for me to start making money. And all of a sudden the Satan saw this weakness and sent him his best friend to offer him a great job. Come, you're gonna make, in six months, you're gonna make 100,000 a month. Mark my word. You start with a thousand, next month five, next month ten, next month twenty. You're gonna see real estate, cash advance, jewelry, I don't know, there's jobs who makes money. His big Yetzirah wake up, he begin to work. Six months later he maybe make a few thousand dollars in years on the side, but it's barely Shomer Shabbat. Who has to pay for all his sins? The one that offered him the job. Are you normally offering a Bachur Yeshiva a job to get him out of the Yeshiva? You willing to take that responsibility on yourself? Some people are stupid enough that they mean well, but they murder the soul. Not intentionally, they meant well. They heard that the guy doesn't have money for anything. They wanted to help out because they are, excuse my words, morons brainless. They don't understand the value of the Torah. So they take them out of the Torah to help them financially. You want to help them financially? Open your wallet and give them $5,000 every month to sit and learn Torah. You make 100000 a month? Invest. Keep your friend learning. If you are such a loser that you don't learn, at least he will create for you millions of mitzvot. Because now you tell him, don't worry about money. I'll give you the money. You sit and learn. I see it by family sometimes. One of the brothers went to work, and he makes good money. And then the younger brothers thinking, why am I learning? I'll be like my older brother. Drive a nice car, dress well, just bought himself a Rolex. How is he gonna help me that I'll be a Talmud Chacham in a few years? And the Yetzirah keep telling them, you see your brother, he's still religious. He's a good guy, he has good midot, he gives daka. So you be a modern religious, modax. What's the big deal? Hashem loves everyone, no? According to some misleading speakers. Hashem loves everyone. They know better than the Rambam somehow. Rambam says Hashem hates some people, and they decide that the Rambam doesn't know what he's talking about. And the Rambam, what he say, where did he learn it from? From the Gemara. Ah, so according to them, the Chachamim, the Tanaim, the Amoraim, they also don't know what they talk about. They know! These modern people, they know better than Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and Rabbi Akiva and all the Chachamim. They're willing to take on their shoulder fake statements that they publish in their speeches, misleading thousands, to dream. Shem love me as I am with my wife miniskirt when we go on her high heels to the wedding with the wig that sweep the floor. Shem loves her. Sure, 100% he's mamash proud of her. Rav Shlomo Zalman Oyerbach Zatzal, one of the main Ashkenazi Talmidei Chachamim in the past generation, and an extreme tzaddik. 
I'm just a huge Talmid Chacham, a real holy person. Holy, holy. If you can call someone holy, he's one of them. And Rav Shlomo Zanman Orbach, I want to remind you, is the person that in a funeral of his wife, after being married to her approximately 60 years, he said to her, you and I know that I don't have one reason to ask you for apology for anything. I never hurt you once in my life. Six years of marriage. I asked the people once in a Shabbaton, who can raise his hand and say that he has one day of his life that that day he doesn't have anything to apologize to his wife about. Baruch Hashem, no one raised their hands. Baruch Hashem, all of you are so honest. I said, okay, let me go a little bit further. Who can raise his hand and say there's one hour a day that he passed, that he did not really do anything directly or indirectly that will upset his wife? Three people raised their hands. But you know, with hesitation. You know these people? <laughs> it took time. So, Tov, Baruch Hashem, we have three tzaddikim here. Sometimes the wife is offended without telling you. Why the wife doesn't tell you? Because she's worried about the main thing you do. So if there's an hour you only hurt her a little bit, for her it's a, it's a gift. Compared to what you do here and there when you get angry, forget it. This doesn't even count in the list. If she goes to the rabbi for Shlom Bayit, and the rabbi said, can you tell me what your husband is doing to you? What, is she going to start telling him thousands of things? She will focus on four or five things, right? Four or five things she will focus on. The things that bother her the most. You understand? So the things that bother her the most, that's what she's going to say. So Rabotai, to conclude, to conclude, so... We have to remember that uh, this Avon of Chilul Hashem, a person has to do anything he can never to fall into it. Some say, I will finish the story about Rav Shlomo Zalman in a second. Some say that one of the ways to fix the Chilul Hashem is to do a lot of Kiddush Hashem. It turns the scale to the positive side. So Rav Shlomo Zanman Oerbach, that was one of the tzaddikei ador and a big Talmid Chacham, he said that 60 years ago, that means 8 years ago now, he passed around 20 years ago, that the first woman who came to Yerushalayim with a wig, and the wig looked, you know the wigs of 8 years ago, it looks like Lifa, you know what Lifa is? Who know what lifa means? The, they, they cut. Lufa. They cut. Listen. They cut the wool of the sheep, glue it together. It looks, you know, like the clowns in Purim, how they have this thing. And they attach it to the woman, covering her hair completely. So Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach say, every blind person saw that it's not real hair, that it's... Uh, some kind of a fake wig from a wool. And when she showed up like this to Yerushalayim, people stood with rocks and stoned her. Tistalkimi poprutza. Now imagine the wigs of today. Imagine they, they, they bring them to the community with all the modaks. I'm not even talking about the mini skirts and the high heels. I'm not even getting there. Assuming there's no heels and there's no mini skirt and there's no tight things or short sleeves or sleeveless shirts like some religious women dress on a daily basis. One thing I don't understand, there's one, there's a woman has yet to be prutza, to attract negative attention against Hashem's will. Why is she so anxious to publish it on social media? See, on the street, you have to go to work, you have to go places. What are you going to do? Lock yourself in the house. You're not willing to dress according to halacha. So because you're going to work, you're committing thousands of sins every minute. Every man who looks at her everywhere. But now the social media, it's not an obligation to go there. To go to work, 
You have to go, you have to take your kids to yeshiva, you have to go. You have to go places, you have to go to the supermarket. It's a way of life. At least here she has an excuse. What do you want me? Not to go to, the, not to, go to my children's school to pick them up, not to go to the supermarket. Not... What do you want me to do? But why social media? Once she put it there, then, then, then the pictures is in every house in the world, and there's no way to get it back. Why, imagine now you became a righteous girl a year or two later, you finally started to work on your modesty. Do you know how terrible you're going to feel knowing that your horrible pictures are in thousands of people's phone? And the worst part is that this is, is going to be the first thing in your trial. What do you think? You're going to come them as, as a rabbit's in, and they're going to show you 50,000 guys with your pictures on their phone. I don't have to tell you what's going to happen to a woman like this standing in front of Hashem. And that's what they're going to show her on the screen. That every loser, every psycho, every biggest low life and dirt, who knows what he had in his mind when he were looking at him. Every second she has to pay for. Multiplied by 10, 20, 50,000. The prettier she is, the more punishment she's going to get. Why? If she wasn't so pretty, not that many people would be interested in her picture. No one would download it, no one would open it. Better for her. But if a lot of people saw it, the more people saw it, the more punishment in Gehenom she will have. And that's what's going to happen whether you like it, whether you don't like it. Whether the Modats, Faker, tell you, oh, don't be fanatic, it's not like that, Hashem is merciful, Beloni. That's what's gonna happen. That's what the Gemara say. That's what the Rambam say. That's what Shulchan Aruch say. That's what every book say. And you open the Zohar and see what's gonna be there. Open Rishit Chochma. They probably have it over there. Chapter one, Mashar Ha'ira. And read over there what they do to not modest women in, Mas in the in Genom. There's a special section for it. Just read over there the Zohar, the Holy Zohar. The names of the angel, the color of the fire how people scream over there, how there's no mercy over there. If I w would be the one who wrote the Zohar, I understand why you hate me. You want to hate Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai? Good luck with that. Good luck with that. I didn't write the Zohar. I only read to you what's written there, which probably you never saw. I wrote the Talmud. I have any credit for it? Baruch Hashem, they don't need me. They managed very well without me 2,000 years ago. What do I do? Read to you what's written there. I'm the Rambam. I'm not the toenail, the dirt of his nail. But to read, I learn. Baruch Hashem, I know how to read. So I read to you what's written in the Rambam. That's it. Don't even need an explanation. You read over there. What's the Midat Adin? What does it mean, Chodesh Elul? Tomorrow night, Chodesh Elul. The beginning of the critical month of the year, and probably now is the most critical halul in the history of the world. Because remember, every day that pass, we are now a little bit closer to the end that it's written by all the Nevi'im, meaning Gogu Magog, the final and most terrible stage of the world. Read Zechariah 14. I'm not Zechariah the prophet. I didn't write the Nevoah. Hashem never gave me Nevoah, I promise you this. I'm not a Navi. Not Navi Emet and not Navi Sheker. In order for you to be Navi Sheker, you also have to be somebody important. Otherwise, no one would look at you. I'm not even Navi Sheker. Even to that level, I didn't get. In order for you to be Navi Sheker, you need customers. <laughs> you understand? People that make you the Mashiach. You see, in Yaman, they had one Pemani faker that pretended to be the Mashiach. The Jewish, Jewish nation had many fake Messiah in history. Some of them were made into Messiah after they died. Some of them were ma made into a fake Messiah in their lifetime. Some of them tried to oppose it, but nobody cared what they say. You are the Mashiach, don't argue. Some of them actually liked it. I'm the Mashiach, let it be. They went into the role. 
And some of them force it on the public. You have to accept me. There was one Temani like this. This Temani, it's actually very interesting because it's written right here in this Parashat Re. Why they bring the story of this Temani in Parashat Re? Let's see who is clever. How is it connect to Parashat Re? Because he's talking about a fake prophet. Yes, your brother is coming to tell you now you have to do Avodah Zarah. You have to do Avodah Zarah. And yesterday I spoke in Queens. What do we have to do to someone like that? Then I explain. So what was the story? So that, like I said, there are two kinds of fake mash Mashiach. There are some Mashiach, they want you to accept them, but there is a limit to how much they're willing to take on themselves until you confront them. <coughs> then they will admit. But, but, there are some people that have mental mental disease, that they are 100% convinced that they are the Messiah. It's a very, very common syndrome. Thousands of religious people today in the world believe that they are the Messiah, and I met at least 10 of them. There's one in Dimona in Israel. I had a Shabbaton there in Dimona, and this guy, every five minutes, you had to see him with long beard and a black hat, and he knows Torah. He knows Torah. And every five minutes he come to me to my ear. Rak, al tishkach basof lagid lahem, shem chayavim lekabel oti. Ani amashiach. Don't forget to tell them they must accept me. If not, they'll have an issue. I, they have to understand that I'm not sure. You see in his body language. Not a joke. A joke. How many times you repeat the same joke? It becomes sad after three times. Maybe 20 times. אמרת להם שאני המשיח כבר או עוד לא? אני מבין את זה. קונקט עם תולי דטקטר, הוא סוואר על חייו. תן להם, חג את התורה וסוואר שאתה יהיה עוד המשיח. הוא יעשה את זה. למה? מנטל פרבלם. זה מאוד קומן. זה עוד אחד בתל אביב, בלואים בשופר. וייק אפ! הגאולה מגן! אנשים חושבים על הטלפון. So that's how the Temani was, the Yemenite. So I'm going to tell you soon all the details. But one thing with the Temani was that the king, the king, the Muslim king, say to him, how do you dare to say that you're the Messiah? It doesn't match what the Jews believe. The Muslim king has to rebuke him. Plus, you irritate us, the Muslim, meaning the Muslim have their own Mashiach. I want some Temani Jew to claim that he's the Mashiach. So he said to the king, if you don't believe me, chop my head off, and after you will chop my head off, you will see how the head connects back to the neck, and I come back to life. <laughs> so someone like that, 100% kill me. I'll prove to all of you that you're wrong and I'm the Mashiach. If it will happen, accept me. I chopped his head off, and the Muslim kids play soccer with his head until today. But he was 100% convinced. This was in the time of the Rambam, 800 years ago, that story. Here, I'll read to you the story. I'll read you the story. The Rambam wrote in his Igeret, Igeret Rambam. וכתבו אליי אחינו שבארץ תימן כתב גדול. Our brothers in the land of Yaman wrote to me a long letter. והכרתי מתוך דברי כותבם שאותו האיש, I recognize from their letter that that person, meaning the one who claimed to be the Messiah, אני חסר דעת. He's very poor in his mental state, meaning he's a moron. And he doesn't have any knowledge in Torah that the way the Mashiach needs to have, okay? Aval, but, Hayai Reshamayim. But he was a God-fearing Jew. 
Right away we have a question to ask. How can it be a moron, an ignorant, am a aretz, a fool, and yere shamayim? The Chachamim say, en am a aretz chasid. If you don't know Torah, you can never be tzaddik. How are you going to be tzaddik if you don't know halachot, you don't know hashkafa? By the way, every person that come and say to you, what is his favorite rabbi? We are going into names. Who is your favorite rabbi? Once you say the name, I will write to you 100% report who this person is. In a spiritual level. Sadiq, Rasha, real, fake, 100%. If he say to me, I admire uh, Santa. <laughs> I know right away what kind of a Jew is this. I admire the clown from Englewood. Right away I'll give you a whole report who this person is. I admire Rav Avigdor Miller Zatzal. Oh, come sit, let's talk. Ah, that's your hero. You already are welcome into my company. Why? Can't be a lover of Rav Avigdor Miller and be a Rasha. Yeah, maybe you commit sins out of desire, but in Ashkafa, in searching for the truth and wanting to be a, a kosher Jew, right away you got it already. Before we even talk. I, over the years, I don't know if you remember, there used to be time that a lot of old Talmidei Chachamim used to come and speak to me after the lecture for an hour or two. Remember those days, Benji? And who were these people? Students of Rav Avigdor Miller. They will come to tell me things that they learned by him and why? You see right away. With the Ashkafa, you see right away. Everyone that was his Talmud, you see the impact of the Rav on his lifestyle. Even 20, 30 years later. You see it today. Once you have a good, kosher, legendary rabbi, even for a few years, you were next to him, same thing in Israel. Everyone that was a student of Rav Ben Zion, Abba Shaul Zatzal, is already some kind of a legend Chacham. I met hundreds of them over the years. Immediately. You see, he was attached to a very, very special Chacham. There are many, many Chachamim. Don't get me wrong. Everyone, Kvodo Bim Komo Munach. But they are some extremely unique in their perfect way, extremely unique. And just give two examples, probably many more, Baruch Hashem. Lo Alman Israel. So the Rambam say, in one hand, he's an ignorant, Ani Chasar Da'at, meaning uh, totally Mishugine, but at the same time, he's Yeresh Amayim. Ve'en bo chokhma klal, he has zero wisdom. Ve'chol ma sh'omrim sh'asa o nira al yado, akol sh'eker ve'kazav. Everything that people say, he did this, and he did that magic, and he knew about that, and he already saw what is about to happen, all the stories that they tell about these fake babas, the Rambam say, akol sheker vekazav. It's all baloney. Rav Aaron Leib Steineman Zatzal, which was one of his specialties, besides being an extremely righteous chacham, lived more than a hundred years, he was someone that was very, very precise in the details. Me'ayen, on every little thing. That's why he became who he became. You know, when he was a kid, he was very short. You know, if you saw him, he was very skinny and short. Kids are sometimes very dumb. They like to make fun. So if everyone tall and strong, and they see a little child like this, short and skinny and shy, and only into learning, is not into playing, no sport, no nothing, you know. It's not cool, like they say in America. It's not cool enough. So they were picking on him. So one time they decided to make fun of him. They took some kind of a puppet and they put it under his blanket. If I remember correctly, they put all kinds of things on it that once he gets into the bed, it will be attached to him or glued to him. And after three days, the puppet was there. He never even saw it. That's when they realized he doesn't sleep in bed at night. 
He lands until he falls asleep on the Gemara, a few hours, and he was a little a teenager in yeshiva. That's when everybody started to give him respect. After trying to make fun of him, three days he's not sleeping in bed, but he was hiding his righteous level. So Rav Aaron Lev Steneman Zatzal, he said, how can it be that a person that mislead such a large audience and public in Yemen and bring destruction to the entire community and the Rambam still call him Yerei Shammai, right? Question that everybody asks, how can it be? And the answer is, Yeshna metziut shadam enora mitivo. Sometimes the reality is that a person is not evil by nature. It's not an evil person. And the only reason that he goes off the path and he behaves crooked is because of mental disease that he suffers from it. Such as today, schizophrenia, bipolar, manic depression, all these things that people have. What was the end of this Mashiach Sheker that appears in Igeret uh, Arambam? Exactly what Rav Steinemann say. In the end, they found out 100% that he's mentally sick. And the Rambam writes, I warned them, to warn that person. He is going to lo get lost, and all the communities will get lost. The end of the story, that a year after the letter the Rambam wrote to them, to the Yemeni Jews of Yemen, 850 years ago, he was caught by the Muslims, the Muslim army over there. And everybody ran away from him. And one of the Arab kings, after he captured him, he asked him, what did you do? What do you have done? He said, your majesty, everything I say is the truth. I only act based on Hashem's orders. The king told him, can you give me a sign that you're a divine prophet, Messiah, whatever? He said to him, of course, chop my head right now. Don't be afraid. I'm giving you permission. Chop my head off and I will come back to life just like you did nothing to me. And the king said, don't you have a something more normal to, to get. The king didn't want to chop his head off. Don't you have something else that I can prove that you're a man of God? That the whole world will, will accept you? Meaning the king gave him a fair chance. So he said, no, that's what you have to do. So the king said, okay, bring me a sword. Chopped his head off. And and it caused a big problem to the community all over. They had to pay a lot of money. The Muslims got very angry. And that's, that's what the Rambam writes. Oto Mashiach Sheker Shabbateman was not even afraid that they'll chop his head. He wasn't afraid. Why? Because it wasn't normal. He was convinced 100% that he cannot die. Or even if he die, he'll come back right back to life. What is the difference between this false messiah to all the others? The main difference is all of them will not take any risk to jeopardize their life or their health or their freedom or their money. They love themselves very much. Hazal are bringing us in a Gemara that when they caught the false prophet, Achav ben Kulia and Tzitkia ben Maasiya, who called them Nebuchadnezzar. This is in Masechet Sanhedrin, Perek Chelek, page, page 93. In Masechet Sanhedrin, there were two fo false prophets their names was Achav ben Kulia, not Achav the king, and Tzitkia ben Maasiya. Nebuchadnezzar caught them, and he said, how about you claim to be special divine people? 
How about we'll do the same test we did with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? We threw them into the fire and they came out alive. Can we throw you also into the fire and you're going to come out alive? Then we'll talk. Obviously, <laughs> you will be like them. Can we do it? They say, yes, but we need you to also throw with us Yoshua Kohen Gadol. It was one big tzaddik, real one. Yoshua Kohen Gadol. They said, they already know there are two fakers, two fake babot. So they say, imagine now two fake babot. The king say, can I throw you to the fire? They say, yeah, on one condition. Give us also the Yenuka. Put us together with him and throw us to the fire. Meaning, Hashem may, may want to save us, but he wants to save the tzaddik. Thanks to him, we'll get saved. We'll hug him together. <laughs> throw us together with Yoshua Kohen Gadol. You know, later on, the false prophet, they knew that they are lying. Like Shabtai Tzvi. Shabtai Tzvi faked it to all the people in Turkey, all these areas in Europe. And what happened? When they threatened him that they're going to kill him, in one minute he converted to Islam not to get killed. How many years ago was Shabtai Tzvi in More than 300 years. And believe it or not, until today, he has followers. Can you believe it? How dumb Jews can be? How dumb? I mean, <laughs> you believed in him. But once he became a Muslim, he converted his religion, you still think it's something special? An ordinary Jew, if someone come and say to him, convert your religion, say you have no share in the God of Israel, bow down to my idol, or anything like that, has to die and not to agree. If an ordinary Jew did not pass the test and bow down or denounce his Judaism or admit that he has no share anymore in the God of Israel or God forbid, any one of those things, he's done. That's it, he fell. Who would believe that someone like that is still special? Especially someone that claimed to be a special rabbi. When I was in Amsterdam, I went to the synagogue on Friday night, and then on Shabbat, I saw many of the things that we pray, the Sfaradim, they skip. Berich Shemed Emare Alma, when we take out the Torah, they don't say. Certain things that we say in Kabbalah Shabbat, they don't say. I got curious. So I went to the rabbi there. And I asked him, why you don't say this and you didn't say this? And he said, over here, we do not do anything like Kabbalah. Kabbalah is not welcome here. Why? as results of the destruction of Shabtai Tzvi Machshimo. After it happened, it affected communities. Nobody wanted anymore to allow any Kabbalists to come, because that's how he tricked the people. His knowledge in Kabbalah and all of that. They said, better we don't teach Kabbalah. Kabbalah is not halacha. That leads me to a question that is very, very coming among many Balei Tshuva. In Israel, you have a lot of speakers that speaks about tikkunim. They're very influenced by uh, Kabbalah, and they mix a lot of Zohar in their speeches, and Ari Kadosh, and other Mekubalim. And as results of that, they speak to Baalei Tshuva, people that became religious, and they say to them that they have to do tikkunim for all the sins they are committed. Such as, if he was with a non-Jewish girl, intimate, there is a permanent damage to the soul. Just because you became Baal Tshuva, you ask Hashem to forgive you, and you're not repeating that sin ever again, and Yom Kippur passed, and all the nine yards of the Tshuva that appears in Ilchot Tshuva in the Rambam, it's not enough. 
you still need to do tikkun goya. Or if you were with a married woman, one of the worst things in the Torah. It's not enough that you cry and break your heart and uh, never repeat it and you're ashamed. Not enough. You need tikkun eshetish. What happened if you were involved in gay activity, even once in your life? It's a source skila, karet. So what do you do? You need tikkun mishkav zachor. It's tikkunim. According to the Ari, the legendary Oli, Ari HaKadosh Zatzal, a lot of these things make a damage to the soul. So you need tikkunim. So a lot of these Kabbalists in Israel they speak very much about it, to do tikkunim. Problem is, there are two problems over here now, two problems. One, many of the people, without mentioning names, some are religious, some are Talmidei Chachamim, some really believe what they teach, because it's written by the Ari, and they don't have political agenda. They speak about it, and that's it. But some only speak about it only for one reason. For what? You know what this, in Israel, you know what it means when you go like this? Money, Money guilt. That's a sign of a greedy person who wants money. You go like this, you get the point. They know that after they speak about this tikkunim, everyone who listens feels guilty. This one was a married woman, this one had Goya girlfriend, this one this, this one that. A lot of tikkunim. Also tikkun karet of Chilulei Shabbat, or Avodah Zara. Someone followed Christianity and, on, and their nonsense. It's also Avodah Zara. So he, he already knows that after every speech he speaks about it, he will get clients. Rabbi, I feel horrible. I just listened to your lecture the other night. I need to do that tikkun. I once was this. I once did like that. I was drunk, you know. Oh, yeah, don't worry. We're going to do the tikkun for you. We're gonna have, we have 10 people in yeshiva. They fast. They learn all night. How much we have to send? Thousands of dollars. Some are more greedy than others. So the only reason they talk about it is for that. Some don't do tikkunim. Even if you come to them, I only teach Torah and Kabbalah, but I, I'm not doing any tikkunim. Why well, go find someone else? So obviously they're not doing it for political reasons. They do it for, for the sake of teaching. So I, Baruch Hashem, my rabbi, as I spoke about him a few times in the past, is perhaps the biggest mekubal on earth today in the world, the biggest. And already some of his Talmidim say there's no one like him. He learned by Rav Toledano and by Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul. Who knows better than him Kabbalah? So he, he, knows, he knows all the Kitvei Ramchal by heart, all the Kitvei Ari, everything. Every question in Halakha, he knows all the Malachim, all the Rashash, this. Very much into that for more than 20 years already. So I asked him that question. I told him, listen, we have Ilchot Tshuva by the Rambam. That's the law. How do you do Tshuva? Everything written in Ilchot Tshuva by the Rambam. I have six lectures about it. Everybody must listen to it now in a month of Elul. The faster, the better. If you can do it tomorrow, all six of them, do it. Two a day, three a day, also good. Quickly, now it's Rosh Elul. Now every day Elul is precious. So I made the six lectures of it. It's called Laws of Repentance Series. It's on CD number one. It's also on a USB. It's on YouTube. You Google it. Laws of Repentance, Rabbi Mizrahi. You're going to see six lectures. Listen to them now. You're going to learn for, according to Rambam and according to Shulchan Aruch and according to the court of heaven, how you're going to be judged and how you can clean your file from all your sins that you committed. Now by the Rambam, do you have any word about Tikkunim? Never. Do you have by Rambam any words from Zohar, from Kabbalah? No, Rambam was 300 years before the Ari. Until the Ari HaKadosh was born, Kabbalah was blocked in the world. Not that many people knew Kabbalah. They had the Ramban, they had Rabbeinu Yonah, they had some student. 
One day there was a rabbi, uh, De Leon, his name was, he brought the Zohar, he discovered the Zohar. But he was in the beginning, or there's not that many Kabbalists. So in the time of the Rambam, he didn't see the Zohar. Remember, the Rambam was a little bit before De Leon. Some say that at the end of the Rambam's life, he already heard about the Zohar. No proof for it. One thing for sure, the Rambam does not bring any Kabbalah in his Psakim. So I asked my rabbi, I told him, listen, according to those speakers that speaks according to the Ari, if you don't do this Tikkunim, your tshuva is incomplete. So what's the truth? Are we judged by the Rambam only like I've been saying to people for years? Or you still need this Tikkunim? Because whenever people ask me, do I need to do Tikkunim? I'm always worried about the charlatans out there and the crooks that will milk them for all their money. So in advance, I tell them, what do you need it? You don't need it. Just do tshuva like the Rambam. That's how we are judged. We judge according to Allah and not according to Kabbalah. So I asked him, maybe I should start telling them that besides the Ilchot Shuvah of the Rambam, they should also do Tikkunim. So he explained, explained it to me in a beautiful way. He said, listen, in order for a person to be a perfect Baal Shuvah and not to be punished for, for his sins, and to come to Shamayim and they accept him like a tzaddik, it's enough to do tshuva according to the Rambam, and you are a Baal Tshuva, and Hashem loves you and accepts you, and you have Olam Abba, and everything is perfect. <coughs> However, the damage that was done to the soul from all these horrible sins, Eshetish, Gay, Goya, and some others, the damage, the impression remains. No one is holding you guilty for that because they know you did tshuva. But there is a way, even that impression, to clean it and purify it completely by doing this tikkunim. But you don't need anyone to do the tikkun for you and definitely you don't need to pay any money for it. No need for it. There is a book of the Ben Ishchai, the holy Ben Ishchai, Neshon Chachamim. Over there you have all the tikkunim that you can do by yourself. One day you fast, you give tzedakah, you read certain things. So the Ben Ishchai has any tikkun you need that you can do on your own. Free. Free. Give tzedakah to any place you choose. Part of the tikkun is to give tzedakah in some of the tikkun. Or if it comes and you don't do it. So the question is if you have a way to do it at home by yourself without anyone taking advantage on you, why not? Do it. You be yotze according to Kabbalah, especially if you're Hasid or Sfaradi. Hasidim and Sfaradim follow very much Kabbalah. Ashkenazim hardly at all. They don't follow Kabbalah besides the Grad, the Gaon Mivina was a legendary Kabbalist and his students and some of the Ashkenazim who follow mainly the Gaon. The rest of the Ashkenazim, the German, the Austrian, the Yekes, they don't follow Kabbalah. The German. So they don't follow Kabbalah. They put filin in Chol Moed. I see in the Shubul, they go in the back. Why? Because the Zohar said that you're not allowed to put filin in Chol Moed. Before the Zohar, Nobody knew about it. The Zohar said it's Moed. Shabbat, you don't put filin. On holidays, you don't put filin. Chola Moed, you don't put filin. Some Ashkenazim put filin. Why? They don't accept Kabbalah. Meaning, I'm not Kabbalah. I respect the Zohar. I learn it. It's beautiful. But I don't dedicate my, my way of life according to the Zohar or according to the Ari or to certain other things. So that's... Uh, you know the joke that they say, you know what's the difference between uh, Sfaradim and Ashkenazim? A few differences besides the spicy food, besides the, the clothes sometimes, the accent, the ha and the ah. 
you know, okay, but there is one main difference. Sfaradim, they're very attracted to Kabbalah. Also, some Ashkenazim that follow Sfarad. You know, in the Ashkenazi shul, you have two styles of Sidurim, Ashkenaz and Sfarad. Ashkenaz is Europe, Sfarad is Spain, which turned later to Edota Mizrach. By this Hasidim, for instance, they're not Edota Mizrach, they're from Europe. But they follow the Nusach Sfarad, which is 98% like the Sfaradim. 98%. Chabad, Hasidim, Sfaradim, very similar Sidurim. Ashkenaz, different order. They say Baruch Shamar before Odu, completely different. But Sfarad is very similar to Sfaradim. But it's very interesting. Sfaradim are very attracted to Kabbalah. Why? The Gemara say the Torah can be divided to four channels. It's called Pardes. Pshat, Remez, Drash, and Sod. Pshat, the simple understanding of the meaning of the Torah. You read, you understand what, what the Torah talks about. That's called Pshat. Then you have Remez. Hints, clues. How many times the word appear in a chapter? How many times this word? Gimatriot, Remazim. Then you have Drash. Gzera Shava, Kalvachomer, Shloshisre Midot Shatora Nidreshet Vaim, and all kinds of Midrashim, which is secrets. Secrets that are not mentioned in a Chumash, in a Torah. For instance, give you an example what does it mean, Drash? Hashem said to Avraham, Kachna et bincha echidcha asher ahavta et Yitzchak. Right? So uh, the, the Midrash is teaching us what really happened there. In the Torah, it's one verse. But there was a whole conversation between Hashem and Abraham. Hashem said to Avraham, Kachna et bincha. Period. Avraham answered, Which son? I have two. It's not written in the Torah. What Avraham answered, you're going to find in the Midrash. Then Hashem answered him, Ed bincha yechidcha. You don't have two, you have one. Why? What about Ishmael? It's not your son. It's your biological son. But it's not your main son. That means it doesn't count. Ed yechidcha, your only son. Avraham still did not get the point. He said, I have one from Sarah, and I have one from Agar. Which one? They bought Yachid Leimo. Each one is a single boy to his mother. Which one of the two? So Avraham, Hashem said to him, Asher Ahavta, the one you love. What does Avraham say? He's still not getting the point. He said, I love both of them. Meaning, I love Yitzchak. So love Ishmael, it's also my son. And Avra and Hashem answer at Yitzchak. Beitzchak, he kare lechazara. Your descendants is only from Yitzchak. Your continuation, it's a verse in the Torah. Only Yitzchak. What about Ishmael? Abba min agoya karu ibna. She came, yes, he converted her. She was a princess, came from Egypt. She said, better to be tail of the lion than head of the fox. We have a saying in Judaism. What's better? To be attached to the lion from the back as a tail, but you're tail of a lion? Or you're the head of the fox? Lion is the king of the animals. It's similar to sport. You have two leagues. Two leagues in soccer. First league is the best 20 teams. Then you have the second league. Another 20 teams, but they're not as good as the first league. They, the first three that will, will finish the season will skip to the higher league. The last three from the higher league will drop to the second level. That's how every year they extend teams. Some dropped to the second level, some upgraded to the top level. 
What's better, to be number one in a second league or to be at the bottom of the top league? First. What number you are in a, in a table of the teams? Number 20 in the top league. And then they ask the second league. What number you are in the league? I'm the champion, number one. Now we have a dilemma. Who should we admire more? The last team on the first league, technically it's still higher than the first league of the second league. But next year will be number 17. Next year. Now we're talking now. <laughs> the season didn't finish. Obviously when the season finished, that's it. There's no more first and second. They exchanged places. So what would you prefer to be? On the top league but on the bottom? Or in the second league but on the top? Huh? It's a good question, no? Good question. The answer, better to be the tail of the lion than the head of the fox. Meaning better to be on the top league anywhere, it's still better than the second league even if you're on the top there. That's a rule in life, in general. So what's the, the Avram, Hashem say to him? It's hard. His whole conversation, it's not written in the Torah. In the Torah, it's just written what Hashem answered him. What Avraham say in between, go to the Midrash and find out. That's called Drash. So we have Pshat, Remez, Drash, and Sod. Sod is what we call Kabbalah. The mystical part of Judaism. The secrets. What happened in the spiritual world. There are four worlds. Atzilut, Bria, Yetzirah, Asiyah. Remember, Abiyah. Aleph, Bet, Yud, Ayin. Atzilut, that's where Kisei HaKavod, that's where all the Srafim, the Malachim. Then Bria, Yetzirah, Asiyah. It's a lot of the secrets of Kabbalah. That's called Sod. Sod means secret. Every Sfaradi who become Baal Tshuva, two weeks is religious. Two weeks. He kept two Shabbos. Still doesn't know Aleph Bet of Alachot. Doesn't know how to do Natilat Yadayim in the morning correctly. Right away he comes to Yeshiva. Can we learn Sod? Can we learn Kabbalah? That's what it is. Sfarad. Fair Sod. Sod. Then Pshat, then Remez, then Dalet. <laughs> the Gemara say Pardes, the Sfaradim say no, no Pardes. Sfarad. <laughs> Fair sod. I remember Rav Yaakov Hillel, one of the biggest Kabbalists in the world, who teach Kabbalah to the Rebbes, to the Hasidic Rebbes in Israel. He came to our yeshiva in Monsi 20 something years ago. I'll never forget his speech. Two things he said in his speech that I still remember. One, remember 25 years ago, the numbers were 400,000 Baalei Tshuva. Today we have way more than a million. But 25 years ago, the number that people estimated was 400,000 Baalei Tshuva, almost all of them in Israel. Almost all of them in Israel. Rav Yaakov Hillel came to the yeshiva, I will never forget this, got angry. Maze! Maze amisparim ha'ele! What is this number? 400,000 ba'alei tshuva. Beloni! In Hebrew, Beloni! There's no such thing ba'alei tshuva unless they enter to the yeshiva and sit and learn a few years, right in the beginning. There will never be a proper tshuva without coming into yeshiva and learn the basics. How many years you have to learn in order for you to know how to learn the Shas, the Talmud? Six years. Six years, gain a lot of experience, learn a lot of Masachtot, Yun, Bekiyut. After six years of learning many, many pages of Gemara, it will be safe to say that now you are worthy to be called a Baal Tshuva. Six years in Yeshiva. All these Baalei Tshuva putting tefillin, barely keeping Shabbos, walking with their jeans. There was no holes in the jeans since time, 25 years ago. You know, and stay in their secular environment. That's Baalei Tshuva. 
and then he say one more sentence. Today every fool that cannot learn Gemara, that his brain is not so sharp, right away become a Kabbalist. <laughs> what happened? Two years is Baal Tshuva, Ani Mekubal. Tavo elai, Ani noten shiurim bekabala. Tanya, Ari, all kinds of big legendary Kabbalim, Kabbalistim. De Ramak, De Ramchal, Kabbalah, Kabbalah. I never understood these Chabadnikim who see a Baal Tshuva with his jeans and ponytail and tattoos smoking nafas all day, if you know what nafas means. Bringing him after two weeks his Shomer Shabbat to, to learn Tanya. Tanya is one of the deepest, most important books. It's full of Musar, full of secrets, Kabbalah, very deep book. Baal Tanya was a legend. It wasn't just a Chacham, one of the important Chachamim over 200 years ago. That's basically the beginning of Hasidut. That's the first Rebbe of Chabad. The Rebbe that passed 30 years ago is the number seven. After that, they do not nominate another Rebbe. Why? Because in their tradition, they believe there will be seven Rabbis and the last one has to be the Messiah. So because they believe in it, doesn't matter, it pass, doesn't pass, they still stick to the story, right here. Next door. You ask anyone over there, the Rebbe never passed, and uh, the Rebbe is still alive. What do you mean? There was a funeral, no, it was all fake. What, they took a body into their grave? No, it was empty. The Rebbe never died, the Rebbe, the Rebbe still runs the world, the Rebbe is still the Messiah. They don't call him Zatzal, like all the other Rabbanim that passed. They call him Shlita. Shlita means that he should live long and good life. One Christian a hundred years ago on a train was preaching about JC, that he is the Messiah. And Hafez Chaim was on a train. Hafez Chaim. After the Christian spoke about the greatness of JC, and JC will come back and redeem the world, and you must accept him, and you must believe in him. The Chafetz Chaim say, Sheker vekazav, everything you say, it's all a lie. To that uh, preacher, whatever, whoever he was. So why? He say, because once a person passed, he can never be the Messiah anymore. How do you know? You ask him. It's a very simple. We had one false Messiah 2,000 years ago. In a time, 100 years ago, it was 19 years ago. Who was he? Bar Kochva. His name was Bar Kochva. Even Rabbi Akiva, the greatest rabbi ever lived, believed that he's the Messiah. Not just the Temanim on Yaman, from the story here. Rabbi Akiva was convinced that Bar Kochva is the Messiah. Why? He had the skills that the Messiah needs. Sixty soldiers coming against him, boom, he knocks all of them on the floor. Even Benji cannot do it. <laughs> Benji, seven maximum. Seven with knives. One minute, they're all dead on the floor. But the eight one will already hurt Benji. But Bar Kochva, 60. 60 on the floor. What? That's not a regular person. It's the, it's the, the power of Hashem is in him. Until... Bar Kochva, his ego, went a little bit above his nose and he said to Hashem, don't help me and don't go against me. I'll manage. <laughs> Hashem sent a snake. Yeah. Tick! Little pinch. And he died. And that second that he died, Rabbi Akiva admitted that he was wrong. And he said, his name is no longer Bar Kochva, Bar Koziva. Why Koziva? Mekazev, faker. Kazav, sheker ve kazav. Kazav means to deceive someone, kazvan. In Arabic, nasab. That's called a faker, a liar, a crook in English. So, from potential messiah, I have one admirer, 
a minute later, a fake liar, deceiver. Koziva also comes from the word achzava, disappointment. Like they say in America, major disappointment. So either way you want to look at it, a liar, deceiver, disappointing, whatever you want to say it, is not the Messiah. This was the words of the Chafetz Chaim to that missionary. And the same thing applies to all Jews. It doesn't matter, Chafzidim, Tzfaradim, Litai, anyone believes that his rabbi is the Messiah, as long as he's alive, and he's from the descendants of David HaMelech, he's a huge Talmid Chacham, a very holy person, he has a chance, but it's not enough. Potential. Potential. He has a chance, I say. And we don't know for sure. When will we know that he's the Mashiach? He has to gather all the Jews into Israel and build Bet HaMikdash and win all the wars and purify the world. Do you know any rabbi that did it in the history of this world? No one. There were great rabbanim. Maybe some of them were potentially ready to become the Messiah. There's some midrash that he has to have a son, and the son will be with him together, and he has to be in Eretz Israel. So the Rambam brings six conditions for the Messiah. One Talmud Chacham once showed me that the Rebbe had three of them, which is impressive. We don't even have those three. But three, it's not enough. You need the whole six. What is it like when you go to your bank, you have six-digit password, but you remember only three? I can't get your money. <laughs> you only remember three. <laughs> what about the other three? Can't get there. Definitely, Rabotai, one of the things that convinced so many of the Hasidim of the Rebbe, because he was extra extraordinary. He made a, a, a network of Kiruv all over the world, thousands of synagogues. Places that Jews cannot find anything, no mikveh, no kosher food. I remember I was in some of the countries, where are you going to get kosher food? The answer will always be Chabad. Go here, go there, Hong Kong, everywhere you go, China. So, obviously, how many people in, in our generation, for sure, that were able to keep pushing, kiruv, 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 kiruv. When you do such an extraordinary work in a short lifetime, 90 years of life, some people would need maybe 900 years to establish so much. So that's uh, out of admiration. Many people ignore the details that are written by the Rambam and the other poskin. I always tell people, there's no problem admiring your rabbi. There's no problem thinking your rabbi is the best in the world or the biggest chacham, or he has potential to be the Mashiach. Whatever you want to think about him, as long as it's a tzaddik, holy person, follower of Hashem, has irat shamayim, and made a lot of people closer to Hashem, is definitely more than worthy. But you have to know when not to cross the red line. Chas v'shalom, some people in our generation, they already crossed that red line. And they took the holy rabbi and turned him into a god. I will never forget, 25, 26 years ago, Rabbi Aderet, now he's in Great Neck, he used to be in Monsi, at the shul in Monsi. The shul is still there. Now a Hasidish rabbi bought the place with the shul, and he runs the, the minyan. He came to the shul with the American newspaper. I don't remember what it was, New York Post, one of those newspapers. Newspapers have two sides, the front and the back. Both of them are the main pages, because that's the first thing people see before they begin to open the news. This you see it on a, on a newsstand. And there was a big picture of the Rebbe, and what was the headline? Listen carefully. I saw it in my own eyes. I'm not telling you someone told me a story. R Rabbi Adderet almost fainted. Almost fainted. And I saw how his hands were shaking. He said to, to the people, look what's going on today, look. The headline was, the Lubavitch Rebbe is God and more. I wonder who is this person that put that headline over there. I wish I could meet him face to face. 
to take a human being, as holy as it may be, and call him a God that's one million percent of Odazara. Remember what the parasha said in Parashat Re'eh, what to do to someone who influenced people to go and turn after someone that is not Hashem? If you read what's, what's written, if we had Sanhedrin, that person that put that picture there in the newspaper would not be able to live another day. They will clean him from the face of the earth. People today lucky in a way that they do whatever they want, there's no executions. I say that if there was Sanhedrin today, how many Mechalelei Shabbat you think you would have? Not even one percent. And all of them would do it hiddenly, in private rooms. No one will dare to be seen in public Mechalel Shabbat. Because that's it, tomorrow you'll be dead. They'll execute you. Now there's no, supposedly, no immediate punishment and people forget about it. And they just make it a way of life. Let's learn a little bit some of the things we have to elaborate that we read on Shabbat and we don't pay attention to. You know, the parasha begins, I'm giving you today cares, a blessing and a curse. Some people think some things in life is blessing, some things in life, it's a curse. And the answer is, everything in life is a blessing and a curse at the same time. The question is what you're going to make out of it. A pen, to have a pen. It's a blessing or a curse? A huge blessing. In the old days they needed a feather with ink. You know how difficult it would be to write? So if you have a, a little pilot pen that costs a dollar, if you are a chacham full of Torah knowledge and you don't have a pen, what are we going to do with your knowledge? No one will ever know about it. You die and take it with you to the next world. Chazal say, Talmid chacham that does not teach from his Torah is like a hadas in the middle of the desert. You know hadas? The best smell. Adasim of, of Sukkot, Arbat Aminim. Smells like heaven. Adasim, you can use it in Avdala. What good is that that we have Hadas in the middle of the Sahara Desert? Once every six months, one Arab with a camel pass by. No, will he be able to smell the Hadas? And thus, you need a place that every five seconds someone come and smell. Million people smell it in one day, and the smell is still there. The more you smell it, it doesn't take away from the smell. It's unbelievable. It's something that you... You see, how you know smell, it's a spiritual thing. No matter how much you smell it, smelling it does not take away the smell. Leave it for, for a while, it's going to get dry, and, it's, and there's not going to be any more smell. But if a thousand people smell it, or a hundred people smell it, the smell will remain the same after. Same thing fire. Ner lechad, ner lemea. Candle. One candle, you can make from one candle a hundred. All you have to do is to take and split. Does it decrease the fire of the candle? Fire can be divided like a soul. Soul can be divided to a thousand bodies, Daria Kadose. Soul can be at the same generation in few bodies. Lakain came back in two bodies. One body was the Egyptian that Moshe killed, and at the same time, the other part of the soul was in the body of Itro. Itro and the Egyptian were in the world at the same time. After Moshe killed the Egyptian, he ran to Itro. The Egyptian and Itro, both of them are Kain. From here, I got an unbelievable idea. I don't know if you remember, I once made a lecture approximately a year ago. Can a person marry himself? <laughs> and everybody thought, that's it, the rabbi is losing it. <laughs> Probably losing his mind. Or it's a gimmick. 
you know, 90% of the viewers and the listeners, as foolish as they are, how, what makes them decide if to click the lecture or not? The name of the lecture. Even though the name of the lecture, especially in my case, have nothing to do with the three hours. <laughs> I will choose from 500 things that I mentioned in the three hours, I have to call the lecture somehow by a name. So I'm thinking, should I call it? Okay, I choose 20 seconds from a three hours lecture, and I spoke about something, and that's how we named the lecture. Now people think, oh, probably three hours is gonna speak about this. <laughs> Don't you know by now that has nothing to do with the actual lecture? So the name, decide if the lecture will have 30,000 views, or 20, or 10, or seven. The name. How dumb you can be! It is what it is. No, nobody used the red. So you know already, if you choose a name that is bombastic, what will really happen to the wicked people in Gehenna? Five hours, 12,000 views already. You choose a topic that people don't want to hear. For instance, the importance of tzedakah. 1,500 views. Why? Don't want to hear about it. Why? It will cost me. <laughs> it will cost me. Watch your eyes. Only women watch. <laughs> if they could say 10,000 views, 9,000 of them are women. What happened to the guys? I take a break for two days. Why? Doesn't want to feel guilty now. All day walks in Manhattan looking at the girls. He looks at the topic. That's why when they tell me in Israel, Rabbi, what will be the topic of your speech? I say, I really don't know until I sit on the seat what I'm going to talk about. No, but we have to put a topic. I say, that's exactly the point. Better not to put a topic. If I will say that I'm going to speak about Shabbat, all the Shomre Shabbos will not show up. Thinking I'm, every one of us is minimum Baba Sali. But they need the lecture just as much as the Mechalelei Shabbat. Not that much greater. Why they won't come? Ah, Shabbat is boring. I'm already Shomer Shabbat. Maaser. Oh, I'm already giving Maaser. Why do I need a lecture about Maaser? Modesty. A, a girl. Wow, Baruch Hashem, I dress like a Rebetzin. Rebetzin of the 50s and the 60s, not of today. Like this, that the dress cannot fit at the door, the way it used to be. I'm very modest. Why do I need a lecture of modesty? I already know, I learned, I, I read that book, Oz Ve'adar Levusha. Very good book about modesty. If you follow that book, you are a modest woman in the eyes of Hashem. After I read the book, I need Rabbi Mizrahi to remind me that I have to be modest. But in a lecture of modesty, 20 minutes are about modesty, and another hour and a half is about other things. Plus, not to listen to something that you're sure that you already know, besides the fact that it's pure stupidity, it's also the advice of the Satan. Because many times the Satan said, oh, you don't need that, you already know it. Believe it or not, that lecture could have changed the person's life. That's why putting a name, whatever name you put, it will discourage some of the people. But wait until I chose that topic and a person marry himself, what reason you have not to watch it? You got very curious. So right away, like a nuclear bomb, everyone got curious to know, can a person marry himself? I mean, the lefty liberals invented all kinds of crazy things. Is it something new they invented now? You're not allowed to address a person by gender. You go to the doctors, how would you prefer to be called? <laughs> how you prefer to be called? So, Rabotai, how does a person marry himself? Very simple. Mr. X died, Hashem sent him back to the world in two bodies. One body we will call him Yosef, the other body we will call her Miriam. 
a soul of, of, uh, of Reuven split into two bodies, Yosef and Miriam. They meet each other on a date. They like each other and they get married. Here is a perfect example how a person married himself. Remember, it's the soul of Reuven. Both bodies, Reuven married Reuven. Here you go. The best part is that they keep fighting with each other all the time. And when they die, they tell them, you fool, you've been fighting with yourself. What, do you have split personality? <laughs> Imagine a person sit on a bench. I want to go swim today. No, I don't want to go to swim. There are other things to do today. Come on, I'm hot. Let me swim five minutes. No, no swimming today. Right away you say that he has split personality. <laughs> split personality is not schizophrenia like some people think. Some people mix between these two mental diseases. Split personality, they have a name for it. Mr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jake, Jekyll, what's the name of it? Dr. Jekyll. Huh? Dr. Jekyll and Hyde. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Mr. Hyde. No. Who is the Mr. and who is the doctor? Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Okay, I was right. I guess, by the way. I didn't remember. Dr. Jekyll. Dr. J. He used to be a basketball player. Dr. J. Remember it. Dr. J. Before you were born. So. Is a person that has two people in him. By the way, when one of them decides to murder, and now when you speak to him when he's on a different personality, connect him to a lie detector, and he has no recollection of killing someone. It's my much like two different people living in one body. Connect him to a lie detector. And he said, I was here, I was there, and he can tell you everything, and you're 100% convinced. You know, I want to ask you a question. When you hypnotize a person, you get information from his soul, from his subconscious. So one person once said, I went to a school to learn how to hypnotize people. I can basically, in 10, 20 minutes, tell every person who used to be in his past life. All I have to do is to hypnotize you, you lose conscious, and I begin to withdraw information from your subconscious, speaking directly to your soul. There's only one problem. The day that they thought how to get you out of the hypnotized mode, I didn't show up. <laughs> I didn't come. So if I hypnotize you, you'll be like that forever. How are you gonna get him out of it? It's unbelievable. This hypnosis is one of the unbel most unbelievable things. While you speak to a person, you discover who he was in past life and he speaks to you in foreign languages that right now he doesn't know in this life. He begins to speak in sometimes ancient languages. They hypnotized one person, he spoke in ancient Dutch from over a thousand years ago. They needed to bring expert of languages from the university to translate the words of the recordings, because no one said these words already for a thousand years in the world. In the middle of a, there was one parapsychologist that hypnotized his wife, because she was suffering from some issues. In the middle of the hypnosis, a voice of a man came out of her thro throat speaking in a language that no one understood, no one. Until they found one specialist that his major is ancient Egyptian, like the time of Paro, to translate what the men say from her mouth. And what did he say? That he's a carpenter that made the image of an eagle to put on a grave of Paro. And nine months after that, they found in archaeological digging, they found that tablet with the image of the eagle. They found it. So yeah, you should watch my, uh, my film Life After Death. All these mystical things in one film. 
people remember their past life, people that were hypnotized, what happened, uh, unbelievable things. There are people that do remember their past life without hypnosis. Many Arabs, Druzim in Israel, kids, he comes and tells you exactly who he was and how he died. One of them was an Israeli soldier in the Israeli army. He, no, 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 he was a shepherd on the Golan Heights. And he found a grenade, he didn't know what it is, he was a kid. Exploded in his face and killed him. So he remembered how he died, he remembered his past life, and he said to his teacher in school, I was a shepherd, I had sheep. I used to take them out to eat. I remember even where I hide my flute. And the teacher said, yes, can you take me there? Say, yeah, let's go. He took him to some place, there was some kind of a shed. On a, I hid it on the top, I climb on the ladder. My flute is on the top. I said, okay, let's climb. They climbed, they saw a flute full of dust from a few years ago, when he was a different person. Then if you remember my film uh, that I showed the Arab kid that was an Israeli soldier in Lebanon, the building in Tzor, 71 Israeli soldiers died. It was one of the biggest tragedy in the history of the army. They all died in Lebanon. And this Arab, Arab soldier, he was 37 years old. The building fell on his head when he died. He was buried there alive. And he came back as a kid who remembered his name. What was his name? Az. Az, 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 Az. All the time he used to say Az. He's three years old. Three years old. Az, Az. They do not know who's Az. They took him to psychologists, this, that. The woman, she was a French psychologist, French Jew, that made Aliyah to Israel. She said, I, I examined the boy, he's perfectly normal, smart, doing good in school, even have some girlfriends. That's what makes him normal. Seven years old, have girlfriends. You know? That's the mind of these liberals. So what happened? He redescribed how he died later on. And he said to his father, take me to visit my wife. Seven years old. Imagine you have a son. Abba, I need a favor. But there is a village over here, 10 minutes driving. I want you to drive me. I'll show you the way. Seven years old. Where you want to go? To visit my wife. Your wife? Yes. Fatma. I miss her. Seven years old. They took a video camera. See, by the Druzim, it's not out of the ordinary. They are very much aware of reincarnation. So even though it sounds strange, the father probably got the point that he's talking about reincarnation. So they come to the house of this Fatma. How old is she? 44. When her husband died, she was 37, and he was 37. But seven years passed. He was reincarnated now, and now he's seven years old in his new life. She continued to live. So now she is 44. You can see it on the video. They knock on the door. She opened the door in Arabic. Ah, kif khalak. Kif khalak, ya Fatma. Ana bahibak. <laughs> Who are you? Majnoon. <laughs> Get out of here. He said, I'm your husband, Adel. My husband, Adel? Is this a joke? No, no, don't hang up. See her, very religious woman, cover her hair. There's no modax by the Arabs. <laughs> <laughs> by them, modesty have to be modest, that's it. So what happened? He goes inside and they begin to talk about their life together. He was a volleyball player. That was his hobby. They took him to the play. This is my team. I was playing here. He's seven years old. And then they opened the family album. Ahmed, Mustafa, Saeed, this. He recognized all the people from the past life. And then he said, what about my uniform from the army? Did you keep it? She said, yes, it's in the closet. And he said to the person with the camera, I can tell you my serial number. 
Serial number has, I think, seven digits. He remember five. The last two he didn't remember. Five out of the seven he remember. Eight years ago. And all the letters that he sent her from Lebanon, there was no emails back then. I'm talking in the, in the 80s, I think it was, or the 90s. So all the letters he wrote to her are in a bag in the pocket of the uniform. The uniform is hanging. She bought all the things on the pictures. Now in the end of the article, you see him standing by his grave and crying. Imagine a seven years old boy standing by a grave and say, what do you feel when you stand next to your grave? You say, it's a very strange feeling. I feel sad. It reminds me how I died. How the building, how the explosion, how the whole building fell on our head. How we all choked. Here is a perfect proof for what the Zohar and the Ari and all the other Kabbalists been saying for hundreds of hundreds of years about reincarnations. Some people do not believe in reincarnations. I used to have an Ashkenazi rabbi, French, very big Talmud Chacham, genius, non-stop learner, non-stop learner. Even in the middle of davening, he cannot stop learning Gemara. Cannot stop. Can't stop him. Can't drive. His mind is uh, so much into the Gemara all the time. He didn't believe in reincarnations. Until we gave him the seminar information. He didn't have what to answer. Once you see the evidence, you can't argue anymore. Anyway, Rabotai, we have a very famous chapter in Tehillim. One of the most famous chapters of Tehillim is, who knows? Uh, that's a very long one. Famous, I said, not the longest. Huh? In Tehillim, you don't have Ashrei Yoshve Betecha Od Yalu Chasela. You have it in a different Mizmor. Ashrei Yoshve Betecha Od Yalu Chasela, Ashrei Adam Oz Lobach, Mesilot Bilvava, Movre Be'emek Abacha, Ma'ayan Yeshitu. But that's not what's written here. Tehillah Le'David. Aromimcha Eloai Amelech starts with Tehillah Le'David. But Chazal added one more verse before the Mizmor in the Tefillah. When we daven Shachrit and Mincha, how do we start? In Mincha, how do we start? Before Shmona Esrei, Ashrei Yoshve Betecha, Ashrei Yoshve Betecha. But the Tehillah le David doesn't have Ashrei Yoshve Betecha. They took a pasuk from a different Mizmor. The question is why? They normally don't do it. Take one pasuk from another mizmor and attach it in the beginning of another mizmor. Many people who don't read Tehillim and they only daven, they are 100% convinced that that's, how the, that's the way it's written in Tehillim. Ashrei Yoshua Betecha Odi Alu Chasela, Ashram Shikach Alu Ashram Shashem Eloav, Tehillah Ledavid. But in Tehillim it starts from Tehillah Ledavid. What is the first pasuk in Tehillim? The first word in Tehillim is Ashrei. <laughs> it reminds me about a good joke. You know, in Israel you have all kinds of people who walk in the gas stations, right? And most of them usually are not religious, and definitely none of them knows Torah. Those are me'aratzot, walk in a gas station. Now in Israel, how do you say credit card? Ashrai. When you go to the gas station, they ask you, Mezuman or Ashrai? So one Breslev Hasid, <laughs> he came to the gas station. So he said to the guy that works in the gas station, it was a cold day, freezing, he said, Ashrecha! <laughs> so the guy, so the, the, no, the, the, the guy from the gas station said to the Hasid, Ashrei? He said, Ashreka. 
זה אשראי, עם עץ קרדיט קארד. דגייס, זה באמת, אשריך. אשראי מינס אאו לאקי איים. It also means credit card, but it doesn't get the point. What does it mean, אשריך? It doesn't know. טוב. Anyway, what's the first פסוק in תהילים? אשרי האיש, אשר לא הלך, בעצת רשעים, ובדרף חטאים לא עמד, ובמושב לצים לא ישב. Three things. Three things. Did not follow the way of the רשעים. did not stood in the place of the Rishayim and did not sit with the Rishayim, meaning the Leitzim. Why David HaMelech start his legendary book of Tehillim with this Pasuk? Because when you open your book, you have to make a very strong statement. You don't want to open with something that is not the best of yours. You have to start with the best to attract the people to continue to read. Why, what's so important about this verse? That's the secret to successful life. If you fulfill this pasuk, you will be righteous. If you don't, you'll be wicked. What does he actually say over there? You want to be a tzaddik? Live with the tzaddikim. Stick with the tzaddikim. Follow the tzaddikim. Invite only tzaddikim. Speak to only tzaddikim. Stay away from the wicked, don't sit, don't socialize with the wicked, don't become friends with them, don't sit and eat with them, don't live with them in the same places, definitely not as roommates. Stay away from them. If you will be with them and you mingle with them, you will be one of them. And you will end where they end in the next world. If you stick to the Bachurei Shiva, to Avrechim, to Rabbanim, to Bnei Torah, You move to ultra-orthodox neighborhood, you daven with the Bachurei Shiva, you will be one of them. Sooner or later, you can run away. Even the secular philosophers acknowledge this phenomena. When I was in school as a child, I remember my teacher say this, this sentence. Adam hu ha-totsar shel ha-sviva. 100% accurate. A person is a product of his environment. If you don't believe me, you can do an experiment. Take a Hasidish boy who was born today in Williamsburg. Send him to Harlem, to Mr. and Mrs. Jackson. I will send him to public school with all black kids with the accent of Jamaica, the Caribbeans, or New York, you know, the accent of the black people. The things the black people love, the food they love, the music they love, the language they speak, the clothes they wear, all their culture. This Yoeli, the only thing Jewish about him after 18 years will be his name. Nothing in his behaving will be Jewish. He will be 100% a black person, even though his skin will be white. But he will speak like a black, eat like a black, talk like a black, sing like a black. And maybe he will be a very good athlete like the blacks are. Good basketball player or football player. They love sports, they're very good in it. Who would ever believe that Yoeli from Williamsburg, Hasid Satmerk, will turn into a star in the NBA? No one would believe. If he would go in Williamsburg, he won't even know how a ball look. Definitely won't know how to speak or to sing, or he won't know what McDonald is, obviously. On the other hand, take Mr. Jackson Jr., who was just born today in Harlem, and exchange him with Yoeli. Yoeli will be in Harlem, and Mr. Jackson will grow up by a Satmer Hasidim in Williamsburg, or in Monroe, or in Monsi. Speak to him in Yiddish, eating a filter fish, eating, uh, you know, things the Hasidim love, Kugel, Yerushalmi Kugel, this Kugel, Chulent, Shah. What, will, what would he listen to? He would listen to all the Hasidish music. All of a sudden he's going to give you Yossel Rosenbaum, Hasidut. Oh! There's few blacks that work in a Hasidic shul for 20 years. You have to see how they sing in Yiddish. <laughs> I have few videos of them in the street. Hey, sing. Sings in Yiddish. 
How does he know Yiddish? 20 years as a Hasidim. He is Kefil Tefish, he listens to Mordechai ben David and all these singers. That's his life. Why? A person is a product of his environment. Whatever they raise you with, that's what you're going to be. You're going to be in the South, you're going to be a Southern man. You live in Manhattan, you're going to be a lefty liberal. <laughs> All the garbage of the world you would love. That's what it is. It is what it is. The more educated your people, your parents would be, the more rotten you will be. It's a fact. You can argue as much as you want. It's a fact. Secular studies is cancer for the soul. It's not supposed to be this way. Really? There is a lot of secular studies that is positive, such as math, physics, medicine. A lot of good things. The problem is that in order for you to be a mathematician or a physician or a doctor or an engineer, which is all positive professions, you have to go through wicked heresy for five, six, seven, ten years and learn everything against God. You cannot be a kosher scientist anymore in the world. In Israel, there's a video of about 10, 12 world-class scientists that became Baalei Tshuva. The best in the world. Most famous scientists. Discover God through their studies. One of them is a physicai le physica garinit. Nuclear. One of them won Nobel Prize winner for math. Nobel Prize winner, what's his name? Professor Oman. White beard, big yamaka. You have to see. Very impressive. The most academic in the world and fully religious. Not Modax. Fully religious. Modax, you have plenty in a university. You know, those with the leather yamaka. Usually they have a specific style. They keep three, four mitzvot, and everything else is secular. Ashkafa, beliefs, goish music, Hashem irachem. Sometimes I meet this kind of people in Israel. You have to sometimes daven with them, you see what they talk about before and after. You see what they admire. Everything the opposite of Jewish Ashkafa. It's not their fault, that's the way they raised them. That's it. The former Prime Minister of Israel was a perfect exam example with this tiny quarter on his head. What did he do to Israel? In one year he was a Prime Minister. A religious person will dare to do so. A religious person can stand in front of the camera and say, I will fight very much for gay rights with a yarmulke on his head. It's not Jewish. That's besides the point. Do you understand the point or no? Do you understand what I'm just saying? Can you stand here with a yarmulke on your head and say, I'm going to fight for gay marriage, for gay rights, that gay people can get married, men with men, and adopt kids? Take off your yarmulke and hide. What are, you, what are you trying to say that you're religious? That's the most dangerous thing. Because some naive people, so he's also religious and he give us right. Go and prove to them that he's not, forget about religious. Doesn't even know Aleph bet of Judaism. But there are thousands like this. I never understood why they put yarmulke on their head. I don't understand. Until today, it's a big mystery to me. In public, they don't keep 1% of halacha, 1%. 99% of their actions is Chilul Hashem. Chilul Hashem! Talking to the wall. Talking to the wall. Go to Barilan University, you see hundreds of them. Sidr Ashkafa, I cannot believe. Igal Amir used to be one of them. After he murdered the Prime Minister of Israel, they locked him in a cage, alone, without the influence of this horrible modern lifestyle. What did he have to do? He has no television, no radio. He doesn't speak to any prisoner. He's alone in the world. Him and Hashem. What did he do? Became a Talmid Chacham. Finish us, finish Shulchan Aruch. All day learns Torah. 
They don't even let him walk an hour a day to see the sun. Every prisoner, they have time that they go, they walk out, they see, they breathe some air. Like this. I assume that after learning almost 30 years Torah, even few hours a day, without the horrible influence of Barilan University and the horrible radio show that he used to listen to and the horrible TV he used to watch when he was a modax, now reading the Rambam every day, reading, reading Shulchan Aruch, reading the greatest Rabbanim in the history of Judaism, that by now he reset his mind in the right way. That's what David HaMelech say. It's not my ideas here. That's the first verse in Tehillim. You want to be a kosher tzaddik? First make sure who are your friends and who cannot be your friends. That's what the Gemara says, speaking very highly of an ex-gangster. Who in the Gemara was a gangster and turned to be one of the greatest rabbi in the history of the world? <laughs> Everybody knows, you see. <laughs> Stories like this, no one miss. People love mafia movies. <laughs> ah, he was a gangster and he became a big rabbi. Where, where can I find the show? Rish Lakish was a gangster, shodad, shodad, robber, and became one of the best, biggest, greatest rabbis in history. Chevruta of the holy Rabbi Yochanan. When Rabbi Yochanan says something, Rish Lakish ripped him to pieces with question. Attacks. After Rish Lakish passed, uh, Rabbi Yochanan went crazy. Couldn't live. Remember, this is Rabbi Yochanan, the ten of his children died. And he didn't become crazy. Stayed perfectly focused. What happened? His Chevruta passed, they brought him a different rabbi. Was very good. But everything Rabbi Yochanan say, agree with him. I have proof that you're right, Rabbi. <laughs> he said to him, what do I need you for? I need someone to resist me, to challenge me, not to say, yes, sir, yes, sir. What happened in the end? The Chachamim gathered together and started to read Tehillim. What was the purpose of the Tehillim? That he should die. That Hashem will take him to heaven. Why? That's where we have the same Judaism, or Chevruta, or Mituta. Or like the Ashkenazim say, Misusa. <laughs> Misusa, right? Misusa. So, so or Chevrusa, or Misusa. Is that correct? Ah, Chevruta? No, no. No, or Chevrusa, or Misusa. You got the point. It's the same lady with a different dress. One day she's Faradi, one day she's Hasidish, next day she's Litvish, the next day she's Temani. The meaning of the words are the same. Just the sound of them are... By the way, why we have so many accents and so many different pronunciations? Punishments of our sins. Exile. Galut. Galus. We committed sins. The land of Israel vomit us, like the Torah says, and we got scattered all over the world, as it's written in the Torah. Yeah, there's verses in the Torah that describe why we had to go to exile. I once told you the joke. HaKadosh Baruch Hu knew that without Hasidim you can never start a new Jewish community. If you want to now go to some place in America that there's no Jews, the real estate is cheap. You want to now build a Jewish community over there. You need to buy hundreds of homes within a year or two. So what do you do? All you have to do is to send 10 Hasidim over there. Minyan. They have a little yeshiva there. They have Minyan, Sefer Torah. Give them a year, you will have everything you need for a Jewish town. They act, they're active. Right away, they bring shochet, shechita, they go, they make a farm. They need a Jewish life. Next movement, oh, first, before, shechita, they can import meat from New York for the time being. First thing, mikveh. Mikveh. 
very important, Kabbalah, you need mikveh, it's purifying the soul. Right away, they make mikveh. Okay, it won't be fancy like the mikveh here, 50 million dollar mikveh here. It will be 50 dollar mikveh. Slowly, slowly, they, they make a building around it. Bottom line, you come after five years, everything you have there, grocery, butcher shop, everything, flies. Satmer Fleisch, Satmer Shrita, this, that, Vishnitz, Bobov. Then comes the Litvish, then the Sfaradi, because everything is ready. So Hashem no, he has to scatter Hasidim in every place he wanted Jews to be, in Galus. So he had like a, like a, like a salt and pepper shaker. <laughs> so he had all the Hasidim in one uh, shaker. And he put a little bit here in Monsi, a little bit in Monroe, a little bit in Yerushalayim, Bnei Brak, everywhere he needs Hasid. When he came to Boro Park, the lead broke. <laughs> <laughs> in one minute, they occupied half of Brooklyn, Baruch Hashem. Ken Yerbu. If you didn't realize, I love Hasidim. When a Hasid is tzaddik, you want to be around him 24-7. Why? You, lo you enjoy to look at his pure neshama. Why? Well, as far as it is, not, doesn't have pure neshama. Litai doesn't have, yeah. But it's already affected by the horrible environment. But when you have a little Hasidish boy, doesn't know anything from his life. Internet, this, you, doesn't know about these things. Look at the face of him, 13, 14. You see the Shekhinah of Hashem. Not that I'm somebody special that I can see the Shekhinah. But believe me, I feel the difference when I see a regular religious kid or a pure Hasidic kid. That doesn't have a phone, doesn't have a computer in the house, nothing, no screens, none of this nonsense. I know you see. I was actually in a bank. One Friday, about two weeks ago, one Hasid came with his son. Rabbi, Rabbi, can you give my son a bracha? I was sitting with the goy. The goy in the bank. In the little rooms, they live in the bank. The goy here, I'm here, and Hasid behind me came. I'm giving a bracha to this Hasidish boy. And I said to the goy, look how pure are these Hasidish kids are. You had to see his face. Yes, all day he sees them. You know, parents come with the kids to the bank. Where are they going to put the kids? No babysitter. People come, women, they come with the kids. The guy! Yes, yes, unbelievable. Unbelievable. You don't see it anywhere else. The guy, that's a kiddush Hashem. What this guy thinks, probably thousands of other going things. What do you think, they're stupid? They see their kids and they see these kids and they know exactly where does Hashem live, in what head. Definitely by the, the, their kids, but the cursing, every other world is a curse with the, the culture that they get from all the things they watch. I'm not excluding the Israeli kids, the secular kids of Israel. The way their parents raised them turned them into worse than animals. Again, it's an insult to compare them to an animal because animals do not rebel against Hashem 24-7. Kids were programmed to be wicked from day one. And that's what David Amelech talks about. Ashre Aish Asher Lo Yashav Be Moshav Letzim. Chazal explained Moshav Letzim, circus, stadiums. Very modern Orthodox love it. Yankee games. <laughs> Abba, can you take me to the Yankee game? Ma? Yankee game? Where did you hear about it? Why, why? I was in camp. My counselor take his kids to, camp, to Yankee games. Go and explain to your son that it's a disaster to sit with 80,000 bombs over there that every other world is cares, smoking grass, women that never dress, and everything you hear over there is the culture of the Greeks. You're gonna be there with your yarmulke and, and, and such a chilul Hashem. Thousands of people over here, they have no idea what Chilul Hashem they do. They go to the stadium. Chazal says, stadium is Moshav Letzim. And I promise you, in the time of Chazal, there was no women in a stadium. Definitely not the way the women dress today. If there was a woman 2,000 years ago, I told you how they were dressed, like a tent. 
And then Chazal say it's Moshav Letzim, and that's what David HaMelech talks about. Chazal explained the meaning of the verse. Moshav Letzim, stadium, kirkasaot of the Greeks. Today is a million times worse than the time of Chazal. Nobody stood and cares over there in a stadium. People had dignity back then. It wasn't like today. Why, well, you had 80,000 people in a Greek stadium smoking grass? Every other word is a curse? All kinds of commercial on a big screen with naked people? No. And Chazal say, Ya'arek velo ya'avor to go to a place like this. Chilul Hashem. Chilul Hashem to go to the stadium. And nobody listens to you. People think you're fanatic. Ah, you're too extreme. What's the big deal to take the kids to the Yankee game once in a while? So put a baseball hat. No, so the baseball hat will prevent the Chilul Hashem. No one will know you're Jewish, supposedly. But what about the influence your child will have over there? Three, four hours around all these chayas over there. Nobody thinks anymore. Nobody thinks. Then he wonder how five, six years later, the son is totally off the derech. He doesn't see the connections. So David HaMelech said to you, you have to stay away from Moshav Letzim. Don't be those who sit in a market on the streets and play sheshbesh, or cards, or domino, or chess on Ocean Parkway. That's called Yoshvei Kranot. Losers that sit on the street like bums and do nothing. And the Gemara say, Yoshev Batel, Kemet Dami. Sitting, doing nothing, count like you are dead. Doing nothing means you don't commit a sin. What does it mean sitting, doing nothing? Not that you sit and watch a movie and every second is a sin, the oraita. No. Or you, or you sit over there and thinking about Avodah Zarah. No. Sit and do nothing. <laughs> Looking at the wall, dreaming. For 20 minutes you sit like this, drinking your tea, doing nothing. No learning, no book, no Gemara, no Tehili, nothing. That 20 minutes count like you didn't live. Yoshev Batel, Kemet Dami. Yoshev Batel meaning sitting, doing nothing, count like you dead. Kemet Dami, similar to a died, dead person. Dead person cannot do anything productive. Sitting, doing nothing, or snoring all day in bed, or laying on a beach, what do you do? I'm getting a 10. <laughs> Why a religious yeshiva boy has to lay on the beach. Rabbi, it's kosher beach. Sunday, a Monday, Wednesday, and, and Friday, it's only men. Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, it's women. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's all religious people. No beseder, religious people. If you tell me you want to go to swim, you want to run a little bit, to do some exercise, maybe you lose some weight, too much kugel and chulent, you want to burn it a little bit, okay. Rambam say, you need a healthy body. But what does it mean to lay on the beach and get a tan? That you're gonna become dark? You'll be red like a tomato? What's the purpose of people that wants to get tan? To be pretty. Yeah. Why would a man wants to be pretty? I'll give you one guess. Usually I don't see in the beach some Hasid try to get a 10. What are you doing here, Mendel? I'm getting a 10. Why does he need a 10? Anyway, he has a beard. Who's going to see his 10? Who's, who's laying there to get a 10? Someone that his head is empty. Rav Ovadia Yosef would lay on the beach to get a 10? No people in the beach. Private beach. Who would lay on the beach to get a 10? I saw even better than that. I saw some Modaks in the winter laying in his backyard with a special silver thing. So what is he doing? What is he doing? Apparently the sun in the winter is not so strong. But with that device, whatever he had there, it hit it, reflects on his face. The man was seven years old, Modax, getting a 10. Why would a seven years old religious man wants to get a 10? Something in his box broke. 
you're laughing, huh? Until I spoke about it, none of you saw anything wrong with all these things. All of a sudden, all of you confirm. You see what's going on with a human being? Really, when you pointed to him, he realized. But the question is why he could not think about it on his own for 20 years. Yeah, you're right. How come I never thought about it? I remember when I was in Miami, Ba'avonotai Arabim, I went to give some lectures there, I don't know, 15 years ago. They took me to a house of some fancy schmancy guy. And uh, I gave a lecture, they brought a lot of people there. And I spoke about the horrible habit of going to the beach with their wives, with bathing suit in front of all the people, men there, mixed beach. I speak. Then I say, I don't understand how a husband will walk with his wife to a beach full of goyim. Even no goyim, secular Jews. They all walk there, everyone is naked, and people look at his wife from morning to night and he doesn't drop dead. There's children there, everyone looks at their mother, and these people have lost their mind. They're not normal. So what does he say to me? But everyone does it, Rabbi. We don't look at it the way you look. Phoenix, since everyone is doing it, it's no big deal. What I answer to this guy, I'm sure he will never forget until the last breath of his life. I said to him, let me ask you a question. This was a Moroccan guy. So Moroccans, Baruch Hashem, they're very passionate people. Full of fire and warmth. The last thing you want is to get Moroccan angry because of his wife. That's already a nuclear bomb. You know the joke that one Moroccan said to his wife, I'm going to shul Friday night. They don't have air conditioning in the old days, so they had a fan. So the fan either can pose in one position or can, can go left and right. So the guy said to his wife, hey Jacqueline, be very careful, do not press the button. I want the fan only on my seat. And I come back from shul, it will be hot. I want the wind to come to my face. If you press the button and go left and right, I'll be too hot. Make sure you don't press. Now she also wants some fan. Once he left, she clicked on the button. When he came back, he saw the fan is going, he went crazy, started to scream. I told you not to move the fan. I didn't touch the fan. So how is it moving? I don't know, from the minute you left, he's searching for you. <laughs> Baruch Hashem, she survived. <laughs> anyway, got hot here, Benji. No, we don't have fan here. So wait. So I said to the guy, let's imagine that you now have a birthday party. And your wife wanted to make you a surprise party. So she invited your father, your brothers, the wives, the family, neighbors, friends, colleagues from work. The house is full of 300 people, and your wife come out of the bathing, out of the bedroom with a bikini and high heels and a birthday cake. Happy birthday to Moshe! She comes like this with her bathing suit, with her high heels and a cake with candles. Moshe, make a fool. Put the candle off. And all 300 people are looking at your wife in your living room with a bathing suit. What would you do? <laughs> I saw smoke coming out of his ears <laughs> just from describing the scenario. He said, I would grab her in front of everyone with a cake and make her fly from the window. I say, your, f your, your ears should listen to your foolish mouth. You just brag that when you sit across the street right here on the beach downstairs in Collins Avenue by the beach with your wife, in front of 10,000 monsters who walk all day like radars to look, it didn't bother you at all. So what's the problem if your wife will be with a bathing suit in front of 300 people as opposed to 3,000 people or 30,000 people? It's less than there. Yeah, you're right. We just never thought of it. 
He could never figure it out on his own until I had to break it up to him. Now, usually back then I used to be optimistic, thinking, wow, that's it, I nailed it. This guy will never dare to go to the beach. But after so many years, Naraiti Gam Zakanti, as you can see. And bad habits die hard. Once a person has a bad habit, it's very hard to change it. Even if it's a disaster, you show him that it destroys his life. I think you can do about it. All of us has it, some more, some less. Either what you eat, or what you smoke, or the time you wake up in the morning, or your pride, or your anger. There's one thing that may ruin your life. Loyalty, and gratefulness, you know, it's all kinds of things. Getting rid of that bad habit is one of the main things in the purpose of life. So Rabotai, the Chachamim took Ashri Yoshve Betecha, they put it in the head of the chapter Teila Le David. What chapter is in Teilim? 145. Kuf Mem Hei. Why did I do it? The Magid Miduvna, 200 years ago. He say, Mizmor Teila Le David talks about praising Hashem. Person praise Bore Olam, master of universe. I will elevate you, my God, my King. I will bless your name, Le'olam Vaed, forever and ever. But there is a condition who deserves to praise Hashem and how to do it. It's not so simple. Don't take it for granted. What do you do? I'm praising God. In order for a person to praise his creator, he has to pass a test. What's the test? He has to understand Romemut Hashem. You know what it means, Romemut Hashem? It's called Irat Romemut. Like the Ramchal explained. There are two kinds of fear when it comes to God. Fear the punishment. Shaking. Like David HaMelech said, My flesh is all goosebumps from fear that I'm fearing your punishment. So scared of you, Hashem. The person that loved Hashem the most in the world, perhaps in the history, was also the one who was afraid from Hashem more than anyone in history, David HaMelech. There's no contradiction. The same way I love you, I'm in love with you, I can't live a second without you, I cannot take you out of my mind, I cannot live a second without praising and appreciating you and feel so lucky that I'm your son, that you gave me Torah, that I can actually do what you told me to do. At the same time, I'm scared to death what will happen to me if I mess up? That's the right Jewish Ashkafa. And all these modern fakers that tell you otherwise are destroying your soul, murdering your soul. Like once person said to, yesterday in Queens, there was a guy from Florida who came. I told him, why you came? He said, to visit you. He said, no, be serious. He said, no, I'm serious. He came from Florida to visit you. And by the way, I also visit my sister since I'm here already. <laughs> It's a good thing she wasn't there to hear. But as a good guy, Bemet, he loves Musar very much. He said to me, where I am in Florida, I went to Daven by a specific community. And I asked the rabbi over there, how come there's not one minute of Musar here the entire year? First time I asked him, he ignored me. He didn't answer. I couldn't help it. I asked him the following Shabbat again. Now he got a little bit angry, or a lot, and he said to me, that's not our style. We don't teach Musa. He thought he's going to leave him alone, but that guy, you know, he's Israeli. Israelis sometimes push a few buttons that they shouldn't push. 
And the guy, out of searching for the truth and caring about the truth, started to push him to the corner. He said, but what do you mean it's not your way? It's the way of Hashem. The entire Torah is Musar. Every other Pasuk is most strong Musar. Every Jewish book in history is full of Musar. With no exception to the rules. Faradim, Hasidim, Ashkenazim, Temanim. Everyone follow the same Musar, or Chot Tzadikim, Israel Sharim. He started to argue with him. What do you mean it's not our way? What, you pick and choose? I don't have to tell you what happened to him after he used those words. You pick and choose? Ah, what does it mean pick and choose? Reformy, conservativy, modax, open orthodoxy, and the rest of their nonsense. Choose what I like, put an X on what I don't like. Doesn't exist. Why? I'm not comfortable with that. You know, in America, there is a famous sentence. I don't like that speaker. Why? He's too judgmental. <laughs> How many times you heard this? I have news for you. Anyone who is not judgmental is wicked. Anyone, with no exception to the rule. The number one obligation in the Torah is to be judgmental every second of your life to your environment and your surrounding. Who you're allowed to talk, who you're not allowed to talk. Who you should live with, who you should not. Who you should marry, who you should not. Who you accept to yeshiva, who you don't accept. Who you give aliyah to the Torah, who you're not allowed to call up to the Torah. Who allowed to marry, who is not allowed to marry. And that brings me back to Rish Lakish. You forgot about him already. Why did I speak about Rish Lakish? The Gemara say after Rish Lakish became a tzaddik, came to yeshiva, from that moment on, he never spoke to any wicked Jew after that. Anyone that Rish Lakish spoke to him on the street, all the rich, wealthy people ran quickly to that individual without knowing him. What's your name? Moishe. Nice to meet you. My name is Yitzchak. What is your job? I sell real estate. Can I invest money by you? You don't know me. Why you want to give me money? I don't need to know you. If Rish Laki shook your head on his, and your hand on your street and spoke to you three minutes on the street, we know one million percent that you are a worthy, righteous person. Because we know him. From the day he became righteous, he never spoke to any criminal or any Mechalel Shabbat or any heretic or any of those. Not that there were too many of them. But if Rish Lakish spoke to you, it means you're righteous. Why? Once he became a Baal Tshuva, he cut completely from his wicked, fake, secular life. You want to succeed, you cannot be one leg in Yeshiva, one leg in Tel Aviv. One leg in Manhattan, one leg in Monsi. It's not going to work. Get it to your head already. The only way to be righteous is to put a big X on your past. But my cousin! Who cares about your cousin? Eating rabbits for breakfast, your cousin. Who cares about your cousin? No, but he's, he's, the, he's the son of my uncle. Wow. What is he going to do? Bring you to heaven? No, but he has a birthday party. <laughs> birthday party. Birthday party in the Torah is only by Paro. Paro had a birthday. <laughs> if Hashem wanted Jews to celebrate birthday, he would say that Abraham Avinu had birthday, or Moshe Rabbeinu, or Aaron HaKohen, or Yosef HaTzadik. None of the tzaddikim made a birthday party. Who made a birthday party? Adolf Hitler of those days. And all Jews have to copy. Happy birthday to Gershon. <laughs> what? what is this song? From the filthiest, rotten, horrible idol worshippers. Where all this music come from? In a restaurant. Ta -ta 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 -ta. <laughs> Fireworks. Why? Yitzchak is 90 years old. Past the Gvurot. Yemesh notenu baim shivim shana. 
אם בגבורות שמונים שנה, is גבורות of גבורות already, ניידי. So let's bring a cake. What's, what do we need a cake with candles? Where does it come from? Well, from the American, from the French. It doesn't come from Shulchan Aruch. Ben Ishchai says, if you want to celebrate, celebrate the day you were circumcised. That's a good reason for a party. Why? You became an official Jew. You joined Brit <laughs> with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. By the way, I don't understand the Americans. Why they're so happy to get older and die? <laughs> if I would be some guy, I would think that every time I celebrate my birthday, it's a reminder that I'm going to die faster now. Meaning my battery, when your battery, when you're disconnected from the charger, it's 100%, you, have, you know you have six, seven good hours. Once the battery goes 90, 80, 70, the, lo the lower it gets, the more nervous you become. Imagine I get stuck with a GPS in the middle of nowhere, zero battery. What's going to be? It's a life risk. So when the percentage go every minute by 1%, like my phone. Now it's 90, in one minute it's 89, 88. That's why the battery lasts maximum 90 minutes. An old phone, a few years old. Why? Because I am not one of those that every three months runs to upgrade his phone. I, I, I use it until it dies. Ah, but there are much better phones. Okay. There's also better cars. This one also drive. There's better suits. This one already two, three years old. Big deal, so there are better suits. There are better watches. What do we care about this? You want to be a kosher Jew, we have to start changing your mentality. Women is a little bit more complicated. You know, women needs this. Nice clothes, jewelry, and especially lots of shoes. <laughs> Don't make that mistake telling your wife before you get married, I want to take a small apartment, there's not enough closet. Can you manage the first two years without buying a lot of shoes? The marriage will be over before it started. <laughs> Just don't touch the shoe subject. Why? I don't know why, but women have addiction for shoes. Remember the story that I had in Riverdale? <laughs> that I went to put my shoes <laughs> out. <laughs> Me and another guy, all day, from the morning to the night, we stick 90 mezuzot in that mansion in Riverdale. Until we finally came to the third floor, the master bedroom, I promise you, Rabotai, I see a closet wider than this wall. Look how long is this wall. With lots of doors. Doors. I'm thinking to myself, do I have to put mezuzot in this closet because it's so big you can put five beds there. The rule usually, if someone can live in a closet, walk in closet, it can be, it can be a room. You can put a bed there. You need mezuzah. But I'm thinking, the closet is very long but it's not wide enough. But there were no shelves yet. They didn't stick the shelves on the walls. So I see 300 pairs of shoes aligned. Green, yellow, black, brown, different style. Two, two pairs. Shnaim, shnaim, ba'u la teva. Like Noach. Mamash tevat Noach. And I see this Persian woman, fully orthodox. Cover the hair, very tzanua. You can see that she's a, from a religious family. Not modax. Husband is very rich, very successful in business, but you can see right away, this woman is no joke, she's very religious. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking, do I need to put five mezuzot in these five doors? You know, you have doors, a lot of doors. So I'm thinking, five sections, do I have to put five mezuzot here? Yes, no, the measurement. She thought that I'm shocked from all the shoes, <laughs> which was also true. So she looks at me with a very shy smile. What can I do, Rabbi? I love shoes. <laughs> 300 pair. And that's before she moved into that big house. Now she has a lot more room. After the shelf's gonna be. <laughs> Probably by now she passed the thousand pairs. So Rabotai, 
That's the key to succeed. Make sure to stay away from wicked people. It doesn't matter birthday party, it doesn't matter bar mitzvah, it doesn't matter wedding, mixed wedding, don't show up. But it's a big embarrassment, it's gonna create conflict in the family. People get upset, they respected us, they can't, there's a, the Satan is the best lawyer. He graduated Harvard 30 times, not one time. <laughs> Hussein Obama did it once, he did it 30 times. The Satan is a very good lawyer. He immediately will give you 50 reasons why you must go to your cousin's wedding. He came for yours. You're not allowed to be ungrateful. <laughs> the Torah says Hashem doesn't love ungrateful people. He will create a fight in the family. He will insult your parents. You have to respect your parents. Your parents want you to come to the wedding. The Satan is a great lawyer. He knows very well how to convince. But the answer is, you're not allowed to step in a mixed wedding. It doesn't matter even if your own brother and your own sister. And if your father gets married for the second time, kids usually don't go to parents' wedding with someone that is not their mother or their father. It's not good. Some goes. The best advice is not to bring kids, especially if they're young. But let's say you went. If it's an ala kosher wedding, you're not allowed to step in. Some rabbi is allowed to go to the chupa. Assuming we men sitting on one side, women on another side, even by the secular people, which is not always the case. Sometimes they even have mixed sitting in a chupa. Assuming that it's a close family, mamash real relative, some rabbis, because of the fear that it will create fight in the family, and Hashem doesn't love fight, he loves shalom, so they're allowed to go to the chupa. My humble opinion, it's not allowed to go to the chupa. Don't listen to me. Yeah, big talmidei chachamim, they allow it. But I'm just telling you, my, my personal opinion is not allowed to go to a chupa of a mixed wedding. Even though there's no dancing in a chupa, and men would sit one side, and women would sit on the other side. So technically, there's really no scene there. Sit, like you're watching the chupa from far. Why, in my opinion, it's not allowed? Because tonight, a lot of ignorant people and some wicked people, some knows what they do wrong, some do not even know. It's a mixture of ignorant, amea ratzot, and wicked. Some people used to be religious, or they know religion, or they was in yeshiva, but they still come, they don't have a problem. 300 or 500 wicked people and ignorant people gather together to declare a war against Hashem. They come with horrible clothing, or oh, everyone there is almost naked, almost no man has kippot, nobody comes with kippah. Sometimes the food is not kosher, or some kosher, some not kosher. The band is not kosher. The music is all terrible goish music. No one will make brachot, everyone will eat, no birkat amazon. Basically, is a gathering of a lot of wicked transaction in one place. Someone who is embarrassed from Hashem, someone that loves Hashem, someone that appreciates what Hashem does for us. Can he show up in such a place? How would it look in your trial in Shamaim after 120 years? that they will show you surrounded by 500 mechalelei Shabbat. Half of them goim bechlal, married to goim. All these fakers with their cigars and tuxedo. Oh, so what's up these days? <laughs> hey, Chaim, with his chicks are next to him, his wife. Hello, oh, how are you? <laughs> and the music of the amigos from Mexico, the muchachos. <laughs> And Mr. Mr. Orthodox Jew from Flatbush showed up. Welcome! Wow! We so honored you came. Yeah, they are honored. And Hashem is crying. This is your devotion to me? Moshe Rabbeinu would enter there? Rabbi Akiva would enter there? The Rambam would enter there? The Ariya Kadosh would walk in? The Ramchal? Rav Ovadia would walk in? Rav Eliashiv, Rav Shach, Baba Sali would walk in, you name it, I give you 5,000 names now. No one would walk in, no one. 
But he walks in and he will even eat. Ah, don't worry, don't be fanatic, it's not meat. It's only broccoli with 5,000 worms inside. <laughs> it's Caesar salad, Rabbi. What can go wrong? Every leaf have 100 worms. Each worm is five sins from the Torah. Each leaf, 500 steaks of pork. One Caesar salad, 5,000 sins the Oraita, 300 years in Genom for one Caesar salad. No joke. Thousands of Isore the Oraita. And the biggest joke, if you come to these Modaks and bring in pork with few shrimps on top. Here. What is this? Peter Luger. <laughs> Argentinian pork. Whatever that means, I made it up. Oh, religious. Can't eat pork. You're embarrassing me. <laughs> I can't eat pork. You just ate 5,000 porks now. In a buffet. Ah, it's very sad. It's very sad, the situation of the people. I want to tell you something. Last Tuesday, Simanto will be the witness. We were very angry. We were here until 1, I don't know, 12 something, right? We wanted to go eat something. We want to go to a quiet place. We went to a place that is usually very quiet after midnight. Nobody there. Take a little table and eat. We showed up to the place. 300 people at 1 a.m. I went to, with my car and he came two, three minutes later with his car. I called him up, he said, we cannot eat here. Why? 300 people here, I don't know what happened. No. So I asked the guy that comes to record me after the lecture with his little clips, mm -hmm. Jonathan, yeah. he was there. I said to him, what's going on here tonight? There was a show, comedy, by this gay field. What's his name? Modi. Modi the gay, who married to his husband. 3,000 Orthodox Jews, fakers, went to see the lousy face of this field. And after that, they were hungry. They needed to eat. Baruch Hashem, they eat kosher. The Torah allowed to look at the face of such a rasha, to laugh from his jokes, when he get on a stage and break that he lives with another man married to him? Hasidim, sitting over there watching this field. Litvish, people with black hats. These people are no chance. They come with, oh, to vomit. To vomit with this kind of orthodox people we have in our community. Nobody even care what they do. Such a chilul Hashem. Who is this Rasha Merusha that organized a show to this field? You bring him in your Shabbos table to sit with his husband next to your religious kids? That's the next step. No one has irat shamayim. Zero irat shamayim. It's all fake. And they think, oh... In Olam Abba, I'm going to sit next to the, to the Rebbe. <laughs> next to the Rebbe, you're going to sit. Your Rebbe would go to see the field of this place. Show me one normal Rebbe that will agree to come to a place like this. Show me one real tzaddik. He tell them there is a comedy. Some idiot. Mentally sick horrible, despicable abomination that imitate Ashkenazim and Sfaradim. Supposedly he's a good imitator. <laughs> How can you look at his face? Not to talk about listening to his voice. This person is one of the most wicked people on earth, not just him, him and all his friends with their abomination. It's a death penalty in the Torah with a permanent cut for the soul. If Hashem gave this gay such a punishment, why are you looking in their face? No, you're too extreme. You're too fanatic. I'm nothing. I'm just telling you what the Torah say. And I also tell you the truth, which you don't like to hear. Your grandparents from Poland and from Russia and from Lithuania and from Syria and from Yemen will die not to look at the face of someone like that. With a gun to their head. 
They are not to talk about sitting two hours and laugh for me stupid jokes. But we need to laugh. We need to laugh. There are a lot of good kosher comedians. Sometimes in the seminars they invite all kinds of religious people. They tell kosher jokes. They also imitate people. None of them. Don't get me wrong. If people have a desire to do a horrible scene, men with men, I don't know, all these things that people do, I'm not here to judge people's weaknesses. No one is perfect. This guy has weakness with women, this one with men, this one with animals, this one with non-kosher food, this one with stealing. Everyone has his weaknesses. We are not here to blame someone that has desire to do things against the Torah. In case you think that we criticize this part, no. All my life I speak to secular people, to wicked people, to people that according to the Torah don't deserve to breathe. And I speak to them with lots of attention and care. I'm not here to condemn the wicked. Don't get me wrong. I am here to speak about someone who knows that he commit the most despicable sins in the Torah that has a death penalty and a permanent cut for the soul. And instead of hiding it and feel horrible about it, flesh with that and brag and press on the nerve of every righteous person around to wave with his despicable abomination. I am great and all of you are nothing. Almost every one of these gays is like this. Here and there you find some that are embarrassed of their situation. They come, they talk to me. I have this problem, what can I do? I cry for a day and night. I want to kiss his hand. That's not a rasha. He has terrible desire. He cries about it. He's hiding it. He's worried. His parents begin to suspect why he doesn't want to go on dates. I'm the last person who will condemn him. Why? He has a very hard test. Just because he has a hard test, and it's hard to pass such a test. It's one thing to fail, even a thousand times to fail, but there is a whole different league of making your wicked status as something to brag about. Making flags, making all kinds of parades, and speaking about it in the open with such ego and pride. And the worst thing is people with beards and yarmulke and sits it all the way to the ground that were sitting in a kollel for nine hours that day, showing up to clap to this field. If he wouldn't brag about it, and few people would know about it, okay. I wouldn't say a word. I wouldn't judge him for being gay. He has his mental issue. All of us are mentally sick. Ego is also a mental disease. Anger is also a mental disease. Stinginess is also a mental disease. Wanting to get attention, like a peacock, is also a mental disease. There are thousands of mental diseases. Mental disease is not necessarily schizophrenia or split personality or bipolar. Every one of the bad midot is a mental disease. Being a liar all the time lying, it's a mental disease. Being ungrateful is a mental disease. Being not loyal all the time, lying and deceiving, it's a mental disease. Being a gay, it's a mental disease. Just like the liar have to stop and the thief have to stop, and all the other sick people have to stop with their sicknesses, the sicknesses of the soul, the gays have to stop. But how will they stop when they brag about it and proud? They call it pride. <laughs> pride. Pride with what? Pride with what? That you go against the laws of nature? That your mind is messed up completely? What is to brag about? Do you know that in the 60s in the United States you will go to jail for that? There used to be time in America you can get execution for that. Some countries in the world, like Uganda and some others, they, they can put you to death for being that. Meaning some countries, they still follow the laws of the Torah. Go in. In Russia, you cannot make a gay parade. Putin will chop your head off. Putin is not a religious man. He's not a... Yeshiva Rebbe, Putin, it's a goy. 
not even a Christian guy. I don't think he goes to church. Probably killed many, many people with his own hand. He was a KJB assassin. He blew up some heads. It's not exactly the Lubavitch Rebbe or the Babasali, Putin. And Putin, with all his killing and whatever he does, is embarrassed that he has in his country people like this. But religious people from Platvush are not, are not embarrassed. When they watch this lecture, don't worry, they will criticize me. I'm the, I'm the problem. I'm fanatic, I'm an extremist, vile, arrogant. No, okay, I don't care if they blame me, at least they change, it's worth it. What's the point, they blame me and in the end they become worse. I want to finish Rabotai with just concluding what we say. In order for a person to be worthy to praise Hashem, he has to first know Him. He has to be scared of his punishment, but there is a higher level. He has to fear Him out of respect. Fear Him because of the punishment is one level. Fear him because he's the almighty, great creator of the world, holy, with all the greatest things you can imagine. Knowing who I'm dealing with, who chose me to be his son, who gave me the Torah, who prepared for me life, world to come, full of unbelievable spiritual pleasure for the soul. And he care about what I'm about to do. How can I not be shaking? Not out of a fear from the punishment. That's a lower level. Out of fear of the embarrassment to do such a horrible thing when he's watching me. Forget about punishment. Even if he give me a get out of jail free card, you will not be punished, don't worry. You will not be punished. If I had irat arumemut, either way I would be embarrassed to do it. Without punishment. That's why they put this in front of Teila le David. The only way to recognize Hashem is to sit in his home, meaning the yeshivot. Ashrei Yoshve Betecha, the house of Hashem is the places of the Torah, the synagogue, the shuls, and Bet HaMikdash. Ashrei Yoshve Betecha, od yehaleluha sela, they will praise you in Olam Abba for eternity. Here, it's here and there. Five minutes here, an hour there, two hours there, and it's over. Over there, I will be constant praising to Hashem. No, that's not going to be no Yetzirah. So those who sit in the house of Hashem can praise Hashem. Those who do not sit and learn Torah, Me'aratzot, zero knowledge, brainless people, horrible ideology, do not even know how to read one page of Gemara, what is it going to help that they praise Hashem? Even when they come to praise Hashem, they will say nonsense, stupid things from their mouth, which I heard many times. That some people uh, say horrible things when they come to praise Hashem. In order for you to be worthy, to deserve the honor of praising Hashem, you have to sit in his house and learn Torah first. Learn who he is. Now when you know who you're dealing with, you will know how to praise him properly. If you won't know, that's by the way the reason why the Chachamim made us a routine prayer. Until Anshay Knesset Agdola 2200 years ago, everyone prayed with his own language. Avraham Avinu said we have to pray Shachrit. Yitzchak say we have to pray Mincha. Yaakov later say we have to pray Arvit. But how to pray, what to say, they didn't say. They just said the time. Shachrit in the morning. Mincha before sunset. Arvit after the stars comes out. That's it. How do I pray? With your own words. Dear God, I love you. Help me. I need this, that. Okay. But then people started to be ignorant. Not everyone is a Talmud Chacham. So what happened when a person is ignorant, he begins to speak a lot of stupid things from his mouth. That's what the Gemara said. Tell me the Chachamim, the older they get, the more 
upgraded they become. Superb, more and more. Amei haratzot, the older they get, the dumber they become. I put my life on it. It's one million percent accurate. All the Amei haratzot, when they become 75, 80, 85, they act like little kids in kindergarten. Look at the old people, there's a shtuyot they talk about. I see, I go to, play, to events, to places. Embarrassment. You go among the Chachamim of Yerushalayim, Sfaradim, Ashkenazim, doesn't matter. Sit with holy people that learn Torah all their life. The older they get, the more impressive they become. Why? That's the way Hashem made the world. Same thing drunk people. <laughs> Once the wine goes in, the secret comes out. What secret? Who you are. Back then, everyone had a beard. Everyone had a turban. Everyone looked like the Rambam. We see a picture of the Rambam with his turban or the Ben Ishchai. There were thousands like this who doesn't know how to read Ibu. Can't read Gemara Bechlal. They all had beard, ma. There was no Gillette yet. And no Philips, no Relco. <laughs> so everyone had a beard. The Goim also had a beard. Everyone looked minimum like the Ben Ishchai. Or the Baba Sali with his covering his head. So what? When will you know who he really is? Give him a bottle of wine. If he's a Talmud Chacham, a river of knowledge will come out. Because until now he's humble, he's hiding it. Once the alcohol goes in, he begins to shoot. If he's a total ignorant fool, all the crazy nonsense from his life starting to come out. His wife say, Moshe, let's go. You don't feel good. We have to go. We have to go. Of course, who else is going to get on the table, take off his shirt, and dance, and break some plates? Like they're doing uh, Greek clubs of, of Tel Aviv and Yafo. Imagine a Talmid Chacham. Give him a million dollar catch to take off his shirt in the middle of a club, and someone will take a picture and put on Instagram. Mendel, one million dollar cash. Take off your shirt, your belly, stand on the table with a glass of beer and say lechaim. And we make a one picture and put it on Instagram and you get a suitcase with a million dollar cash. Will he agree? Any Talmid Chacham will agree? If someone agree, you know he's a faker. For sure he's not a Talmid Chacham. Talmid Chacham will agree to take a picture without his shirt? If he went to the religious beach or religious pool and some snake came and took a picture, it's not his choice, he didn't want it. Nobody had permission to do it. But deliberately, come, come, take a picture of my muscles. <laughs> Who does it? Only people that their brain is empty. The Rambam say. Once wisdom of Hashem goes into the brain, all the nonsense is pushed out. Once the wisdom of Hashem doesn't go in, there there's a lot of room for all the garbage. Once the nonsense go in, the, the, the wisdom go in, it push out the nonsense. Once the nonsense go in, it push out the wisdom. That's so true. So true. If you don't believe me, look at the kids in Ben Azmanim. What a drop in their spiritual level. Those who do not go to a religious camp, who sit and learn every day, at least half a day, besides the sport over there and the swimming, after three weeks doing nothing, they go from here to the bottom of the bottom. Baruch Hashem, the yeshivot starts again, Rosh Chodesh Elul. If it was up to me, I would cancel the Ben Azmanim completely, completely. But who am I? Gdole Israel think they should be Ben Azmanim. Who would listen to me anyway? If it was up to me, I would make a law, no Ben Azmanim. It's a pikuach nefesh, sorry. No, but they need some break. They need to renew their energy. In the old days, there was the excuse. But today, that three weeks can destroy his neshama permanently. He won't even go back to yeshiva. How many Talmidei Yeshiva the Ben Azmani murder cannot count? Thousands that they never came back. Are they going to be responsible for it? I don't know. Don't ask hard questions, please. 
you need to ask those who support Ben Azmanim. I'm against it. Totally against it. I would give one week off in Sukkot, one week off in Pesach, and that's it. That's it. Rosh Hashanah, two days off. Kippur, two days off. That's it. Shavuot, one or two days off. Nothing else. Why? It's pikuach nefesh. Walking in the streets, seeing what they sing, not learning Torah for three weeks, davening at 10 o'clock in a shtibol, being in a synagogue at midday already after shachrit. Midday they come out, I see, I pass by, sometimes I drive on the street, I see people, people coming out of shachrit at 12 noon with their feeling like this. I give them the benefits of the doubt. Maybe they sit and learn three, four hours after shachrit. But we all know that some learn when the other ones just finish to pray shachrit at 12. Why? No shame. Remember what my rabbi Berkovitz said? One time he had to daven alone. Because he figured if he will make it to the shul, it will be 9 a.m. And he cannot take the risk of doing such a chilul Hashem, showing up to the shul at 9 a.m. Such a chilul Hashem. Imagine those who come to shul at 10.30. 10.30. They show up. They became... Ergel nafach leteva. His grandfather, the Hasid from Ukraine, from Russia, Lutuinia, if you bring him from heaven now, his, his grandfather, that by 6 a.m. already will be after Shachrit, already with the Gemara open. And you show him his grandson waking up at quarter to 10 in the morning, no Kriyat Shema, no nothing. By the time he gets dressed, check his messages, show up. To, good thing he doesn't come from Mincha, Shachrit, Mincha, and Arvit in one shot. All three. His grandfather wouldn't know where to hide. This is your grandson. But again, Rabbi, you too much, you fanatic, and this generation is a different generation. Tough. Look for excuses. I want to just finish, Rabotai. Moshe said to the nation of Israel, everything in a creation has in it blessing and a curse. The Torah is a blessing, but if you only use the Torah to get personal gain, to take advantage on people, it becomes a curse. Chazal say, Zachar na'aset lo sam chayim, lo zachar na'aset lo sam amavet. Wealth is a blessing, birkat Hashem itashir, but wealth can also be your destruction, osher shamur lebealav lerato. There's few billionaires in the Jewish world, give millions of dollars every year to yeshivot, to kiruv, to a lot of good things. Few in the whole world. Thousands of people sit and learn Torah thanks to their money every year. For them, wealth is the greatest blessing in life. Then you have George Soros, Imach Shimo. $35 billion he gave, every dollar was used against Hashem. Everything against Hashem. Every evil thing that the Satan promotes, he runs to sponsor. Is he cheap? Absolutely not. He's very generous. He gave 35 billion dollars to Tzedakah. How many people on earth can wave such a number? How much you give to charity? In your entire life, 2 million, 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, 20 million, wow! 35 billion in Machshimo. Every one of them for lefty, liberal, progressive, anti-God activity, for abortion, for making a coup in Israel, making the liberals take over, finishing the religion, everything that Hashem hates he promotes. Even the Hungarians going in Hungary put a huge signs on the street that is the demon of the world. Yeah. Yes. George Soros in Machshimo. People like this, you, can, you must say Machshimam. Some people say Shem Reshaim Irkav, but people like this, the representative of the Satan, it's mitzvah to say on them in Machshimam Vezichram. In Machshimam Vezichram. What can you do? Here you go. The money that he made, people think 
This guy survived the Holocaust, cooperated with the Nazis, told the Nazis about all the Jewish property, where to find it, and the Nazis let him live. And now, a year or two ago, they asked him in an interview if he feel guilty about helping the Nazis against his own people, the Jews. He said, absolutely not. No regret. No regret. He has no regret. He has no regret. So you're wondering, why does Hashem give this low life a hundred billion dollars in his lifetime or more? If he gave 35, I assume he has a hundred billion. Why would such a monster will get so much money? The answer is to make his hell deeper every day. If he wouldn't have money, he wouldn't be able to help the Satan to destroy the world. Now when he gets money, all the money goes to negative things. That means his verdict becomes worse every minute. Another million to here, another million to there, five million to the gays, ten million to this, to the Hamas, to, to everything that Hashem hates he gives. So, the money that he makes is 100% poison for him. The money that these kosher Jews that sponsor Torah and Tshuva and Kiruv, it's the best blessing. They help widows, they help orphans, they help the shul, they help the mikveh. They help so many people with their money. Every dollar they make, it's a great blessing. Some people, they do not donate to good and do not donate to bad. They're just cheap, stingy, they don't give anything. What's they're burning their money on? To get their belly bigger. For pleasure. Ferrari, Bentley, a yacht, business class, nice homes, art. They don't give. Well, at least they don't sponsor all the evil in the world. They will have a big problem that they use the money for tzedakah. They'll kill themselves for that. And in the end, when they die, half of the money will go to Sleepy Joe and his friends. That's the law in America. And the other half, his three sons will murder each other for the money in court with lawyers. How many families broke to pieces because of that? That would be the end of this stingy fool. He did not use the money to buy Olam Abba, especially now Elul. How many times we have to say it every year to the people? And only very few get the point. Buy your Olam Abba. Why? You're not gonna be a learner. You're not devoted. You're not such a davener. You're not sitting and reading Tehillim with tears. You don't do full tshuva for all your horrible sins. Your heart is not broken to a thousand pieces. You're not even accepting to change your bad ways. So uh, you have only one weapon left. Now you have nothing. Only one thing, tzedakah. That's it. Tzedakah tatzil mimavet. Tzedakah tatzil mimavet. Tzedakah will save from death. Not only the righteous people, even the wicked people. That's what they don't get. If someone will ask you, according to the Torah, you're righteous or wicked, if you have 1% decency and honesty in your heart, you know that you're not righteous. You know it. Shabbat is not Shabbat, learning is not learning, the mind is not clean, the eyes are not clean, the mouth, Lashon Ara. Kosher is not 100% kosher, jealousy, anger, all kinds of problems. Anyone can raise his hand and say, Ani Tzadik? Someone who say, Ani Tzadik, for sure is the biggest Rasha. <laughs> you know it. Because a humble person would say, Ani Tzadik? When I say to my rabbi, wow, I'm so impressed in this. <laughs> when he's sick, when he has pain, I ask him, what happened? He said, Be'avonotai Arabim, always the same answer. From all the scenes, <laughs> I wish all of you to do <laughs> one percent of the scenes. There's no scenes. What scenes? He's devoted to Torah fully all his life, so many years. I asked him, I, I didn't feel good. I had to go to the doctor, hospital. What happened? He said, It's all from the scenes. A person who doesn't commit one sin a month. Have pain and he blames himself. I brought it on myself. People who commit million sins every day, why Hashem is doing it to me? It's not fair. I don't deserve it. <laughs> That's the way it is. 
You know, one time he needed 12,000 shekel to fix his teeth. Why? Because he's fasting so many days. When you fast a lot, your teeth fall. Did you know it? If you don't eat the right proper food, your teeth become weak. Then one day you bite on something, they break. These Kabbalists, they fast a lot. They hide it. Well, oh, today I'm fasting. You see, they fast, they do all these things. So his teeth started to fall. It's not so old. Back then he was maybe, maybe around 50 years old. So I, Baruch Hashem had a friend in Israel that have three dental offices. Good guy, he came to visit me in Queens. He came to the lecture in Queens. We met. I listened to you for years, I love you, anything you need, I'm going to help if you have student in Israel, dental. Well, then I found out that he's suffering from his teeth. So I said to the guy, okay, I'm going to pay you, you give me a good price, I'm going to pay you and take care of all what he needs, implants, this, root canal. He went one time, he went the second time, first time it was evaluation, x-ray, all this. He went for the second time, he saw how long it took to start fixing one of the tooth. And it didn't go. It didn't go. And I already paid the guy up front. I said, this is for everything, take care of everything in it. Then he said to me, oh, Rabbi doesn't come. I said, you sure? I said, yeah, we made him an appointment. He didn't show up the third time. I called him up. Why you don't go? He said, listen, I calculated the amount of times I'm going to have to go to the dentist until I will be able to fix all the three teeth. The amount of bitul Torah it's going to cause me, it's not worth it. I will manage with the few teeth I have left. I don't want to fix it. Why? It's going to be more than 10 hours bitul Torah. When you're in such a level, every hour is eternal. Everything you calculate. Go to a birthday party, four hours, jump like a monkey with Goish music. Forget about the Bitul Torah, the embarrassment of that. Why he didn't come to the lecture? Oh, Rabbi, I'm sorry. Why? <laughs> the best answer is I went to a yard site. Yard site. Some people, they make their yard site more fancy than Bar Mitzvah. Catering, catering place. Very nice. Everyone sit, eat, steaks, shish kebab, this, drinking whiskey. Of course they would prefer this than two and a half hours of this annoying speaker drilling in my head. Tov, New York site. At least they did something for a deceased person. Well, what, what excuse there is a birthday party? Drives me crazy when I hear it. Why I didn't come to the shiur? My cousin had a birthday party. My neighbor had inauguration of his daughter. She finishing law school. What do you care about the daughter of your neighbor? What do you have to do with her now? She have some party in a... What? No irat shamayim. Replacing diamonds with sand. Replacing diamonds with sand. Do you know anybody in the 47th Street that are willing to replace diamonds with sand? Go one boot from the other. Find me one Bukharian, or Afghani, or Persian, or Kafkazi, or Georgian, or Syrian, or anyone else, the Hasidim there in 47. Give me a box of diamond, I'll give you a box of sand. If you will find the one, please let me know right away. <laughs> I have a lot of sand in my backyard. <laughs> please just tell me where is that fool. Well, something inside me tells me he won't be so successful finding him. But when it comes to eternal diamonds, everyone is a fool. What do you do? There's a game. Playoff. Playoff. Two people fight about a piece of leather if you're going to the basket or not. Three hours he sat and wasted. They make billions. And he's still unemployed. <laughs> what is, how does it help you in life? At least you would sit, learn three hours to write, get 180,000 mitzvot. One day you cash out on your reward. The Yetzirah is a genius. He's going to let you learn. Same thing with Sdaka. 
Now Elul comes. What can be a bigger saving than donate tons of money? Shem, I want to save your children. I'm not perfect, at least let me help others to become better. Me not fixing myself, it's a problem, obviously. You have to be tzaddik. So if I do nothing about it, plus I don't care about anyone else, I have a big problem in Rosh Hashanah. But if I come to Rosh Hashanah, I'm not perfect. Did I get rid of my anger? No. Did I get rid of my laziness? No. Did I get rid of all my other issues? No. Did I improve my Torah learning? No. Did I improve my modesty? No. Everything, no. Did I save other souls? Maybe yes. Five, ten, fifteen. Money. Money. Zell, Venmo. Checks. That's it. Nothing else left. People not getting it. That's only one card that can save you. All the cards are gone. One card, the joker, it's Daka. That's it. And that's what Chazal say. Chazal say, Tzion b'mishpat tifadeh v'shaveha b'tzedakah. The nation of Israel will be redeemed and a judgment day. How? Those who will do tshuva by giving tzedakah. Clear verse. What will save the people? The tzedakah. Why? Because nothing else they did correctly. If you sit in Elul, you take off from the business, you come to the yeshiva in Monsi, you learn from morning to night non-stop, you do tshuva, you daven, you do slichot, you come to Rosh Hashanah like the Baba Sali. Tov! You don't have to give ton of tzedakah. You took care of your neshama with your own hands. Anyone here will do it? Probably not. Those who listen now at home, probably not. What, what weapon are you coming to the trial with? You have nothing to suggest to the judge, nothing. The judge is going to read all the, the list of the accusation against you. You're guilty in everything. You got to pull out something that will save you from losing it. There's only one way. One way. What is it? The judge said that if you will donate enough to something he likes, he's willing to look the other side. Do you know one person will not do it? Trump pardoned a lot of Jews before he left office. I always thought, because he liked Jews, and he's you know, always been nice to Israel, but now I found out that these people paid him fortune for it. It wasn't for free. Send money here, send money there. It's through middlemen. It's all there's those brokers who cut a coupon. Some of the serious criminal that had to sit in jail for life, 30, 40 years in prison. The only one he actually released, which is, was fair, is Rubashkin. He wasn't there, he wasn't supposed to be there in the first place. Maximum four years he was supposed to be in jail, according to all opinions of all kinds of judges and lawyers. The anti-Semite people of the court send him to third years in prison. Him, he should redeem him because that was the right thing to do. Other criminals? From some I heard what they did, they stole millions of people, destroyed thousands of families. They were supposed to be buried there and in hell for a thousand years. All of a sudden they go after one of them from Lakewood, that crook, that did a Ponzi scam, did it again now. Why would they release such a monster that stole money from thousands of people? It's like almost releasing Madoff. Why? Money. Millions of dollars go under the table. That's the corruption of those politicians. You know, there's mitzvah to redeem a Jewish prisoner from jail. But many people think if there's a mass murderer, let's go and collect million dollars to release him from jail. No. Someone like that should be in jail forever. Don't do anything to release him. A drug dealer who sells drugs to thousands of kids, you should do everything you can to keep him in jail until he died there. Even someone who lives with his wife without mikveh, you're not allowed to release him from the jail, the chazoni say. Unless he sign a guarantee that if you release him from jail, he will only touch his wife after the mikveh.
חזון איש. Why? It's better for him to be in jail. Why? If he comes home, he does his story karet with his wife every day. Karet, karet, karet. She's nida. She doesn't go to the mikveh. Keep them separate. Are you allowed to do shalom bite between secular husband and wife? Not allowed. Not allowed. Better they'll be separated. Why? They move in back together. They have intimacy a few times a week. Every time they're together, both of them get a cut for the soul in the court of heaven. They will curse you forever for making peace between them. We're not talking about revenge. I'm helping you make peace between me and my wife. She doesn't want me back home. No. Better you be separated. You're such a cool rabbi. Why you don't help me? For your own good, you fool. I put you back in the house every time you touch her. It's karet. You do not know what's waiting for you. I know, so I have mercy on you. If I didn't care about you, first thing I do, make peace between you. Let you be in hell forever. One time I gave a lecture in Roslyn, Long Island. The end of the lecture, I see this woman, looks like Miss Universe, come after the lecture, crying, shaking. This Jewish Ashkenazi woman. I, I'm so inspired. You know how some people are emotional after a good lecture. Can I talk to you? Yeah. So I, I hear about her problems. Her husband threw her out, out of their big mansion. She was married to one of the richest Jews in the world. He has 5,000 employees working for him. That's how powerful her husband was. And he took away their two kids. She can only see the kids on Sunday. He bought her a nice apartment somewhere that she has where to live. He gives her monthly allowance. And that's it. I asked her why. He caught me with cocaine a few times. She has drug addictions. I'm struggling with that, you know. Cocaine, the drug of the rich people. He gave her ultimatum once, twice, three times, I don't know how many times, threw her out. He has lawyers, judges, everyone in his pocket. She had no chance to fight. He said, take it or I won't even give you that. She agreed. So now she's broken from her life. She came to a Torah class. Someone brought her. Come see what uh, the religion is. So she's starting to become religious, but she's totally ignorant. She never learned in her life. She didn't go to yeshiva, nothing. She started to come few lectures. About two, three months later, she comes to one of my lectures, again in Long Island, with an Italian goy. Look how miserable the Jews in America are. She had no idea that she's not allowed to be in relationship with a goy. Innocently, she comes to me, Rabbi, can you give me a blessing to succeed with my relationship with this guy, Richie? Wait, who is Richie? Is he Jewish? No, he's an Italian, Sicilian. Sicilian. She has no idea. She comes to me for bracha. But I should give her bracha that she married that guy. What's the halacha say? What do I have to, what am I supposed to do? Do everything I can to separate between them. I must. It's not a choice. A Jew is drowning in a lake. If you don't jump to save him, you are almost a murderer. Why? You let someone drown. The guy came to me, the goy. He was inspired by the lecture, the goy. He said, what do you think about me and her? I said, can I talk to you on the side? But you promised me not to say anything? Not that I took his promise as a, something you can rely on. He say, yes, of course, Rabbi, of course, you can tell me. I say, I suggest that you break up with her. What? <laughs> he came for blessing. I say, why? I say, she has problems, she struggled. What? She's a drug addict. That's why she got divorced. Before you be destroyed in your relationship, run away. He took my advice, he ran away. The next day she left me such a recording, if you hear the curses, she was cursing me on the phone. If she had a gun and I was there for sure, she would shoot. 
she cares me in any possible curse you have in English. And she doesn't even know I just saved her from hundreds of years in hell. She would marry this guy. Every time he would touch her, it would be horrible punishment for her. When she goes in front of Hashem, he will show her that five minutes message. How she's cursing a person who saved her from hundreds of years in hell. And from that, she will have to get a separate punishment. Not that I wish her any bad. I hope she will become righteous and marry a Jew and, have, and get out of the drugs. But it's so sad. Those who save you, you curse them. Those who drown you, you kiss their feet. That's what's happening today. All these movie stars, all these athletes, all these corrupted politicians, people run after them with such admiration. And they are making your hell deeper every minute. And those who can save you and save your eternity, you only have negative things to write about them. Why? That's what Chazal say. Alma, the Shikra. The world of lies, that's this world. Be'ezrat Hashem, I want to wish every one of you a successful and meaningful Elul, full of tshuva. And we will meet after the judgment day, after Rosh Hashanah. Those of you who understand Hebrew, you can watch my lectures in Israel. Those of you who don't, I will have one or two lectures in English in Israel. Two actually. No, because the time is different in Israel. When I give the lecture in English, here it's 1, 1 p.m. No one will watch Your it at 1 p.m. Your absence is a class next week. In the week. No, no, we will fix the calendar, don't worry. Be'ezrat Hashem. Baruch Adonai Lohlam. Amen ve'amen. Rabbi Chanani Aben Akashia Omer.